Well, you heard, uh, uh, Angelo, you don't often have two applauses at the end of a film, do you? And what a mixed um, emotion we had. The film is great. You ended keeping us in suspense, but at the same time making it seem as if you were filming it now. But of course you were filming it then, and the film actually ended with a sense of, um, with a, a, a sense of triumph, something achieved. But now those hopes have been dashed. So in a way, this makes our work all the more critical, the need to pers persevere even greater. Um, so I'm really happy that Angelo, who, as I said this morning, not all of you are here this morning in my introductory remarks, Angelo was the one who really inspired us, inspired me to get this project going under the auspices of our International Observatory for Cultural Heritage when we decided that we had to be worried about the US, not just about the, the so-called US, I like to say, not just about um, Mesopotamia, Babylon, and Italy. Um, because the loss of the heritage, the threats to memory here are as grave as anywhere else, as we learned this morning. And Angelo, three days after I decided that we should do this event, um, I read Angelo's great op-ed in the New York Times, which was a kind of condensed version, in some ways verbally extraordinarily more eloquent than the film. We always say pictures say a thousand words, but somehow in that op-ed, which I suggest you all go back and read, Angelo made the case for bears, bears ears in these threatened times even more important. So Angelo, or even more urgent, Angelo is um, about to complete his uh, PhD at NYU, and we've brought him up, so to speak, from both from Utah and from downtown to um, come up here to this university. And he really has been an activist all his life, and he still plays this critical role of being the um, director of the um, Native Students at NYU, Native Students Organization at NYU, as well as working on behalf of indigenous peoples everywhere. So Angelo, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Your inspiration has been fantastic. There you are. We couldn't really have been here had it not been for Angelo's quiet devotion to the cause, his suggestion of names, his helpfulness in constructing this entire event. Thank you, Angelo. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, uh, well, I'd like to thank um, everyone at the Italian Academy here in Columbia, especially uh, David Freeberg and everyone else who put this stuff together, Allison, Barron. Um, and, you know, uh, everyone who came out, um, I'm really pleased and I'm excited. The collection of minds, of intellect, of passion, of people who are excited to do this kind of good work. Um, and a lot of them I've uh, crossed paths with in professional circles and also just out there on the land. Um, and I'm really glad that we have this opportunity to come together and talk about these places. Uh, in a good way, in a passionate way, and uh, that this is a rare opportunity that you guys have. You have a lot of great um, uh, indigenous scholars and people who work with indigenous communities and are showing you the best ways to do that. And I think that's huge, um, especially in an academy like this, and that, that can't be understated. So um, I'm really, really glad that uh, we're taking that that time and energy to really take it to the next level and elevate this conversation. And um, also, like David said, you know, I'm, I'm at NYU in the anthropo anthropology to progr program with the uh, culture and media documentary film program. So we uh, did this film project as one of the, um, the uh, student films. And that original one was a shorter 20 minute one, but I added a few more minutes as you can see with the actual designation going through. <laughs> which is great, um, and it kind of gives you a fuller sense of things that have happened. But as we all know, it, things have changed even more dramatically very, relatively recently. Um, and so I, I'm really uh, honored to be here to be, be presenting and uh, talking with all of you. I'm also 
happy to acknowledge the Lenape people as well, but all the other tribes that are, you know, part, um, you know, stewards of this land here that we're on in this island of Manhattan. You know, everyone from the Delaware to the Shinnecock, the Ramapo, uh, Haudenosaunee, like, you know, it, it was a very transitory place. A lot of people came through back then and they're still doing that now. And it's a collection of people and ideas and, and um, technologies and amazing things, great ideas uh, that were being shared here. So it doesn't surprise me that we're all here together again and this is where we're gonna share that news and move forward with it. So much like uh, my heritage and my background as a Navajo and Hopi person, uh, I'm a runner and I run every day. And you know, I went out to Central Park this morning and you know, like it's not just a hyperbole, it's a kind of a, a cultural tradition I try to maintain. And part of that tradition, even as a Pueblo person, as you learned earlier today, is uh, you know, we had messengers. We had people who ran to these different communities and we, we organized and we informed and we brought things back. And historically, the messengers were the ones that even the enemies would let through their territory because the message you have might be important. So I'm really glad to be able to deliver more messages here to you today. Um, so to follow up on the film a little bit, I really wanted to emphasize a couple things. Um, the film itself is a very broad introductory you know, foray into what Bears Years is about. It comes more from my perspective and my family's perspective as a Navajo and a Hopi person, but also it really does a great job of kind of giving you a sense of the place. And, you know, it's hard to tell you what 1.9 million acres looks like, and it's even harder if you're not there. Um, so the best way that we could think of doing that was through like an aerial shot with a drone. And I had no idea at the time, but apparently uh, I'm the first one in the culture and media program to use drones in our student film. <laughs> so <laughs> now they probably have to do a drone workshop and that's all my fault. Um, but you know what? Whatever, like indigenous peoples, we have always used the latest and greatest in technology and we've shared it with the world. So, you know, we're bringing bear's ears to you in ways you can't even possibly imagine right now. It's part of my job as a fellow at Utah Denebikea is like, uh, I do a lot of media facilitation. So I talk with a number of journalists and reporters, documentary filmmakers, photographers, artists, anybody that wants to do uh, media production, especially related to like audiovisual materials, because that's really an important and powerful part of our own identity is how do we present ourselves to the world, right? So now we're, we're in the throes of, actually sharing bear's ears in a number of really cutting edge technological ways, including drones and 360 video and photo 3D grammetry and just all kinds of like insane crazy stuff to like uh, give people a sense of not the, just the place, but what's there. The very rich heritage of indigenous peoples that have left behind many wonderful things including just extensive, beautiful archives written on the wall. Just images and maps and directions and stories and all these beautiful rock art and photography. And like, if you can think of um, going all the way back and imagining people leaving their mark, you know, we've, we've only scratched the surface, literally, of what's there. There's so much to know that we're all still very much catching up on. And I'm gonna really like emphasize that here um, with my talk. And you know, I, I think I should just move forward ahead right now in this so I can get it out of the way and then we can just combine a question and answer for the film and the presentation afterwards. So um, I just wanted to point to you right now. Um, I don't know if this thing works. Oh, it does. Uh, so right here, this is a native design by one of our indigenous artists, and it's the uh, coalition, but it's also in the shape of the monument. So it's a bear with a feather. And you can see that on the map. And um, we are really proud of that design because uh, like, it emphasizes, again, the solidarity and the unity of all the tribes working together. 
let's see. Do I? How do we move it? Okay, there we go. Uh, so let me start with this so we can kind of decolonize your minds, first of all. Um, let's think about not the region of Utah and not the region of the Four Corners, but to the indigenous eye, what does that region look like? And this would probably be the most accurate way because you can see that the rivers form all the, the natural boundaries, um, especially the southern end is the San Juan, and then up here you have the Colorado River. And this is um, the area of the Ute Mountain tribe, a Ute Mountain Ute. And then there's the Navajo and the Hopi down here. And then way up here is the Northern Ute, Uinta and Ure Ute. And those are the five tribes of the coalition that all have shared heritage and interest in preserving bear's ears. Okay, so this right here is the um, earliest form of proposal by Harold Ickes as uh, a four million acre monument. And this is back in April of 1936. And you can see in this old map here, similar boundaries, San Juan River. And this cuts in all the way up into the Gran Escalante staircase. So you can see that very early on, there was consideration of making that entire area already a protected space. And this was something that people didn't really realize when they were making uh, claims that this was a midnight monument. Not true at all. <laughs> They've been talking about this since the 30s. Just to give you a sense, and there's a lot of data here, but it's kind of hard to see this far away, and you can take a look at it later, but there's um, uh, a majority of all of the uh, Utah Navajo support for Bears Ears. And actually, at one time, historically, factually, there was uh, unanimous support for it with all of the Utah Navajo chapters. So there's only one chapter that's dissenting, and that's usually uh, the one that we hear about the most in the media. So an important point to bring up is the Antiquities Act. Um, and this was um, really not designed with indigenous peoples in mind. It was really kind of sort of the um, evolution of like social and human sciences in which they were trying to like preserve these items and these things, these objects um, that were you know, geared towards study in areas like archeology span and anthropology. But that's why when you heard Eric say in the films, like you never heard of indigenous peoples using the Antiquities Act for our ends, right? So we kind of turned that around and we leveraged it and we said, well, yeah, we actually do have all of this uh, heritage that needs protection. And it's a, it's a resource, but also, um, and if you look into the uh, proclamation and I have a bunch of those little pocket proclamations that are brought. You can unfold them and you can see the Obama proclamation. One of the uh, key things listed in there is the traditional knowledge aspect. And that itself is a resource because you are um, invited to sort of understand what the traditional knowledge side of those tribes have to contribute to the overall knowledge of the place as well as the objects. So um, to give you a better sense again of like space, because I'm all about visuals, uh, you can kind of see from the borders of this, there was quite a bit cut out of there. And a lot of people are more familiar with the center point right here in the, in the middle where the, the ears are that come out of the landscape. Uh, and this is a more detailed map here that had come out of the US Forest Service and National Conservation Lands Project. And um, you can kind of see like different sites that are named on there. But most people don't really uh, have a, a great idea of just exactly how many um, archeological sites there are. Um, there's thousands, thousands and thousands, and a lot are not all uh, accounted for or documented yet. Okay, so we already kind of heard this too. Um, it's about 65% of federal land ownership in Utah. So this is part of that public lands debate where everybody's sort of uh, vying for different lands for multi-use or for extraction or, or business purposes. But uh, you can kind of see here with this little orange color and this map here, that's all federal land. And then down here is the little chunk of Bears Ears where it's all federal land. So. You know, it's misleading when a lot of people are saying like, oh, it's a land grab, it's a federal land grab. It's like, no, the feds already have it. Like, you know, get your facts straight. 
so this is it's a real misinformation campaign um, on the majority of the stuff that you heard, and that's why um, I feel like my intervention is very important because we not only represent ourselves, but we also try to set the record straight. We try to make things factual and get a little bit more of the indigenous voice included in our representations. So to give you a sense, everybody started out with a proposal of the 1.9 million acres. And then it went to a compromise of 1.35 million for the actual designation. So there are some areas in there in which a lot of people um, wouldn't want to budge on. And um, a, a lot of that were like already areas that had uh, mining interest involved. And so now we see like it's, around, it's about 228,000 acres with the reduction with the Shashjat Monument and the Indian Creek one. So as I said before, the traditional ecological knowledge part is also extremely important. And um, this is, I think, the, one of the ideals of the coalition, striving to make a more collaborative land management plan, because it would be one of the first of its kind and extremely advanced in having that indigenous knowledge component. If you know anything about parks and monuments, when those developments had been uh, made uh, early on in this country, they were done without native input and involvement. In fact, they were done in mind to remove them and displace them out of these places. So beautiful areas like Yosemite and Yellowstone, you know, people think of them as like a Garden of Eden, like this untouched by man, it's pristine and, you know, beautiful and it's undisturbed, which is completely not true. It's been inhabited and stewarded and taken care of by us, by indigenous peoples. In fact, a lot of those places are sacred places. And that's why they're so beautiful is because we took care of them. And if we had been included from the outset in these ideas about what stewardship means or conservation or preservation, it would have a totally new and different outlook today than what you would know of it right now. So I think that's the kind of ideal that we're striving for in the Bears Ears National Monument, is trying to include that from the outset and understand that traditional knowledge is just on the same equal playing field as Western scientific knowledge. In fact, you can't do good Western science knowledge without traditional knowledge. Those are what the cutting edge institutions are doing. So you have to understand both sides. And if you want to take it from a really general but very uh, direct view, you can say that really traditional knowledge is it's kind of like an accumulated knowledge of a place over long periods of time. Native peoples have been in these places for centuries, for a very long time. They have seen it. They know what's going on. They pay attention to the sun and the stars and the weather, the seasons. And so really what you can say is it's observational data over generations on an environment. Why wouldn't you want to ask them? They would know the best, right? So traditional knowledge of stewardship and best practices of land management, um, they're still coming together and trying to figure out a way to be more collaborative and use both of those Western and traditional knowledge ways. And this is a, oh, I was gonna say, let's see. This is a cool um, picture of them harvesting uh, traditional foods out there in Bears Ears that the, uh, the kids are gonna make for dinner. And this is uh, another perspective of uh, Comb Ridge. So I just wanted to point out quickly that there are uranium interests in Bears Ears. And I think that may have had some influence, I think, in reduction processes as much as the, the oil companies have had and have had previously, especially in the other sections uh, in the, um, the corner of Utah where Anath and Montezuma Creek had been impacted extremely heavily, which you saw in the film. Uh, water and um, you know livestock getting poisoned and people having a difficult time trying to have a livelihood. Uh, the same area that my grandmother raised our family on, you can't even really live there anymore. All the, uh, the springs are dried up uh, due to the oil drilling. It's really just kind of cracked what's underneath the surface and uh, you, you can't really live there. Uh, so the De Niro's mine on that side is still operational and still uh, something that was intentionally left out of the monument. I think the federal government has seen it as something um, 
as an energy zone or something that could be used for uh, potential energy needs or who knows what other kind of nefarious warfare purposes that uranium might be used for. Uh, so this is also going double for the Gran Escalante National Monument. Of course, there's coal there and uh, there's uranium there and there's just enough of it to make it interesting to reduce those things so that people can go get it, like corporations and businesses, but also the government which benefits um, uh, to, to lease those things out. So what we see here is kind of a, um, a network of uh, obstacles in which we're facing and trying to protect these beautiful places. And you can see also with the uh, Utah Monument proposal that there's also uh, oil wells dotting all over the place here and uh, uranium interests in these places. And you know, despite what they tell you, like, oh, there's not enough to go mining, like, that doesn't mean they're not gonna do it. <laughs> because they do, and they have. And uh, it's kind of amazing to me just to see like how, pe how much people are still putting faith in uh, the processes of the government saying that, oh no, we're not gonna do that, when it's like, uh, clearly you see from Standing Rock, they weren't supposed to do that, and they did it anyway. So there's already a precedent, you know, like there is going to be uh, some incursions into these indigenous territories and we shouldn't be surprised by that. What we have to be doing is actively fighting it. So, and there's an 85% reduction in the designation, allowing for opportunities of mining, drilling, and extraction. Um, the claims filing had opened up on the 2nd of February, and uh, the renaming of both the monuments, Shasta and Indian Creek, was also kind of divide and conquer tactic where you know, they named the southern part Shashjat, which is Bears Ears and Navajo. But really, as a coalition, everyone decided to have it just Bears Ears because that's what it is in all of the languages. So it's all represented in all five uh, of the tribes. And, you know, to add more to that point, like, as an anthropologist, I've always found it fascinating that Zuni is a language isolate and they're not related to any of the other family tribes or family uh, lineages of, of language. And so they came up with bear's ears on their own. Bear's ears had its own relationship with the people that were there. So it revealed itself in its own way. And that goes all the way back to the old stories. So right there for me, it's like, okay, that's traditional and scientific knowledge. What more do you want? You know, for us, it is the bear's ears. So this is kind of where we're at right now is the monument reduction has a lot of people really um, on the defensive and trying to figure out where all the sites are and where all the places are that are unprotected. And people are super interested now. We've seen a 200% increase in visitation in the Bears Ears region. And so I think a lot of folks are coming here on the daily just trying to see it before something happens to it. Um, over here at Comb Ridge, this is a really significant site. You saw this in the film as well, but that comes all the way up from San Juan River and then goes all the way and, um, up towards Blanding and then Bears Ears is here in the middle. It's just one long, beautiful, elongated kind of a red cliff face that goes all the way um, up into the monument. And there's a lot of history to, here too. And um, the Utes especially have a lot of history there of resistance, and they call it the last Indian uh, War of the United States. I think it was like in the 1920s with uh, Posey, Chief Posey. And so that's really also um, something that people don't really understand is like the current history is related to the very also recent past. The 20s weren't that long ago. And if you think of like a, a skirmish with Indian communities, with the Mormons and the federal government, like of course that transfers over into today. There's a lot of other issues besides just Bears Ears. It's that's the tip of the iceberg. Underneath it are all these other underlying issues of discrimination and racism, exclusion, and violence. So my last point I want to make is that uh, the tangible heritage, the things that we can see that we can touch, that we can actually visit. Things like you know, the ruins and the petroglyphs and uh, some of the materials left behind. And, and this is a good point here with the macaw feather sash. You, know, you can see that the exchange was alive and well, and it was great distances. A lot of people came through Bears Ears, and they left their marks on the walls. 
and they left their materials behind. And this coming all the way from the south, where you, only you can find those, those feathers down there. And you, if you know what you're looking at, can kind of really culturally interpret like, well, that's not ours. That's not ours at all. There's a lot of people who came up here to visit, you know, build trade networks, have families, uh, visit communities, and some of those stories are still alive and handed down through the tribes. So the intangible heritage part, that cannot be separated from the tangible heritage part. That actually completes it, much like the traditional knowledge piece and the Western knowledge piece. I could have this thing or this object, right? But I can tell you what it's made of and like how recent it is, where it came from, but I wouldn't have much else unless I talk to the people. And that's where we come in. And that's extremely important because you can't know what the thing is without the people. You don't know what it's called in the language. You don't know how they made their materials, what they painted it with, what the songs were, what the rituals were, the ceremonies, all the things that were affiliated with that and how even we still use them today. And that's extremely important because without it, then really you're separating it and you're not having the full knowledge of heritage. So that kind of points more towards uh, a lot of the work that everyone else is here is doing, especially with the UN uh, Declaration on Indigenous Rights. Uh, this is more towards the work that I'm leaning toward right now as well with uh, in intellectual property protections for our communities. And so we're doing a lot of that now where we're protecting um, the, the same kinds of culturally sensitive data, you know, songs, ceremonies, uh, rituals, uh, language, all the things that we think need additional protections in this kind of exchange of us inviting people to take care of bear's ears. There's also like a level of trying to get people more um, attuned to what those cultural sensitivities should be with working with indigenous communities. So yes, the Bears Ears gatherings have been happening for you know a couple of years now, and we have another one coming up in July. So in mid-July, um, all the tribes will be coming together at Bears Ears for another gathering. But again, that invitation is open up to you guys. So like, if you ever want to come by that time, that would be the perfect time because we'll all be there. Um, come on by. I have a big backyard. It's 1.35 million acres. Um, there's some. We'll find some room for you. Um, but you know, this is really one of those things where we want to pose it back to you. You know, this is the responsibility of you as an American citizen as well. You may not be indigenous. You may not know what Bears Ears is like, what it's, what it feels like to be there uh, in that beautiful earth with all this life around you. But this is your responsibility now to speak up and do something. You have accountability. You have resources, you have powers more than you can imagine. And that's most of what the world doesn't have are the same things that you have. You have social mobility, you have resources, you've got money, you have networks, you have reputations, you have professionalism, you have skill sets, you have all these things that can move things that need to be moved collectively. And for those people who feel like this is a desperate time, I don't, I disagree. I feel like this is a good time for us to work to collaboratively now, more than we've ever had to before. Because if these five tribes can stop fighting amongst each other, then I think we can all take that lead and understand that it's time for us to put our differences aside and protect the things we love most. These are these are the most important things. The work that I believed in, the work that my grandmother believed in. We never got to see the monument happen. And this is different than anything I've ever seen. It makes me happy, you know? It's the kind of thing that all my elders tell me that Bears Ears is for. It's for healing. Historical trauma, historical injustice, contemporary ones. I don't believe in the government so much as I believe in you guys. And I'm going to trust you with that. And you wouldn't feel the same way unless you were, you know, 
you, if you weren't here, that would signal something else, but you're here. And that's why I'm telling you, from the tribes, from the people there on the ground, this is important. And I th I'm thanking you for that, because what you're witnessing here is still the extension of that coalition. I may not know these people who work with me on the periphery, but I am going to, because we have to. And they're not just friends anymore, they're family. And we're gonna have to deal with all the things that will be difficult because we gotta protect our home. And we're inviting you to come to our home. And we're just inviting you to be as respectful and sensitive and responsible and accountable. Do better than your ancestors did. Do better than the ones before you did. We're trying to do the same thing. Yeah, thank you. Right now, um, we're going to hear from, I believe, Elizabeth Hutchinson, correct? She's from uh, Barnard College, uh, Art History Department, and she'll be speaking on Indigenous aesthetics and the sacred landscape. Um, Elizabeth? The uh, schedule changes because I'm teaching a class this semester on Native American art history and I've asked my students to be here. And when I agreed to go after Angelo, I didn't know how amazing his presentation is going to be. So I, um, I'm very humbled. And uh, although he exhorted us to decolonize our minds, um, Mine is not sufficiently decolonized that I will not be presenting a very academic sounding paper. So for that, I apologize, but I do have a lot to say, and so I've, I've written it up, and I hope you'll bear with me. I've been teaching Native American art history here at Barnard in Columbia um, since 2001, and um, we've seen a lot of growth on campus of people taking an interest in indigenous issues and coming to understand that you can't study indigenous um, history or culture without um, taking on questions of sovereignty and, um, and decolonization. So um, I'm grateful for this opportunity and thank you to the Italian Academy for including me in um, some of the discussions around this event. And um, I also want to acknowledge the um, that we are in indigenous territory. And like Angelo, I want to point out, because I think it's very important that this is Lenape territory, but it is also territory through which many indigenous peoples have passed, continue to pass, and will pass in the future. The picture on the screen by Anishinaabe artist I, um, Isaac Murdoch was used in many posters supporting the indigenous water protectors who came together to, uh, at the Oseti Sakoan camp at the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota last summer to, in an attempt two summers ago to prevent Dakota Access Oil Pipeline from being built across land sacred to the Dakota people. The scale and force of the No Dapple protests, which attracted supporters from indigenous communities across the nation and globe, took many by surprise. Murdoch was one of many Native artists who created work designed to respond to and sustain this movement. In this piece, we see a representation of Thunderbird, a figure associated with the sky and especially with thunder and lightning, descending to earth with a heart full to offer leadership in the care of the earth and the waters, as the artist put it. It is an integrated image, as the Thunderbird is conventionally conceived of as male, the complement to a female underwater panther, or sometimes serpent, associated with the earth, and especially for the Anishinaabe peoples whose homelands center on the waterways of the Great Lakes and what is now the US-Canada border, water as a sustaining element of life on that earth. Referencing historical works such as this bag that balances male and female sky and earth by juxtaposing Thunderbird and Underwater Panther, Murdoch connected the contemporary protest 
often seen by outsiders as grounded in politics and centered on a struggle over the human right to clean drinking water, with traditional indigenous understandings of the relationship between human beings and other aspects of the material world. As Anishinaabe law professor Deborah McGregor put it, for indigenous people, water isn't a commodity, it's a relative. The attempts by coalitions of tribal peoples to preserve the ancestral lands of the Southwest have garnered less national attention, but they too have inspired artworks that give visual form to indigenous reciprocal relationships with sacred landscapes. In my brief talk today, I want to introduce the work of a few artists working in this area in the hope that they might expand upon the discussions we've been having around law, history, and activism in this conference. And I'm only going to show a few artists, and, um, and so I am sorry that I'm not necessarily able to, to cover all the wonderful works that have been produced, and many of the works that I'm looking at um, aren't very recent. Enrolled member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes of the Flathead Indian Nation, Jean Quick to See Smith's Petroglyph Park series, produced between 1985 and 1987, invite comparison with the Standing Rock artworks. At the time, residential development of the western edge of Albuquerque, New Mexico, was destroyed in an area of volcanic cliffs above the Rio Grande River that is one of the densest sites of petroglyphs in North America and has traditional and historical relationships to Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache peoples of the region, as well as traces of early Latinx and Anglo presence. Though not from the region, Smith, a local, understood the significance of this land and created a set of works that responded to the lengthy legal battles that challenged developers and were sold to raise funds for a push for the preservation that eventually resulted in a portion of the Mesa being preserved as Petroglyph National Monument. This piece at left, called Courthouse Steps, responds to a specific incident during which a landowner picked up a boulder covered with petroglyphs with a forklift and delivered it to the local courthouse steps in a protest of what he called the delays in letting him build on his own land. And you can see here um, the, the integration of different kinds of iconography. So at the upper left, we have the kind of trembling towers of the commercial development of the area, um, things that look like the um, kinds of McMansions that were going up all over the escarpment. And that's juxtaposed on the lower right with iconography that speaks to the petroglyphs, um, to the iconography of dwelling and dwelling in harmony with the landscape um, in community that draw on the petroglyphs themselves. Uh, Smith's uh, use of abstraction is uh, both a modernist gesture and a visual strategy employed by many Native artists who, as Kate Morris argues, have every reason to avoid issuing further invitation to an already appropriated landscape. The paintings create a connection between artists across centuries responding to the formal qualities of the mesa and the life-giving environment in which it was situated by connecting her gestures with paint to the rock inscriptions of ancestors. Native artists Elizabeth Woody and Joe Federson have described petroglyphs as, quote, artworks that serve the land and indigenous history by providing a greater connection to the story of how we came to be, how we have learned to become humans, and what prophetic visions we have inherited. Similarly, Laguna Pueblo author Leslie Marvin Silco, who grew up not far from this mesa and other ancestral sites in northern New Mexico, has characterized rock art as creation stories made visible and noted how they link history and environment as a means of communicating essential information for Pueblo physical and spiritual survival. Quote, interrelationships in the Pueblo landscape are complex and fragile. The unpredictability of the weather, the aridity and harshness of much of the terrain in the high plateau country explain in large part the relentless attention the ancient Pueblo people gave to the sky and earth around them. Survival depended upon harmony and cooperation not only among human beings, but among all things, the animate and the less animate, since rocks and mountains were known to move, to travel occasionally. 
She writes in her 1986 essay, Landscape, History, and the Pueblo Imagination. Going on, Pueblo potters, the creators of petroglyphs and oral narratives, never conceived of removing themselves from the earth and sky. Standing deep within the natural world, the ancient Pueblo understood the thing as it was, the squash blossom, grasshopper, or rabbit itself. I actually brought a piece of pottery in which we can see some of this, a contemporary work um, by an Acoma potter, Francis Torrivio. Um, Standing deep within the natural world, the ancient Pueblo understood the thing as it was. The squash blossom, grasshopper, or rabbit itself could never be created by the human hand. And this is what they depicted. Ancient Pueblos took the modest view that the thing itself, the landscape, could not be improved upon. The ancients did not presume to tamper with what had already been created. Movement through the Pueblo world past sites associated with the emergence and migration of ancestral peoples brings out the spiritual or mythic dimension of the Pueblo world even today. As the talks we've been hearing are demonstrating, lands sacred to the indigenous peoples of the Southwest, lands through which Indian people travel pursuing activities of ancestors at the sites whose locations came down through stories, extend well beyond the boundaries of reservations and include places valued by descendants who are today members of different tribal nations. The destruction of boulders, springs, and hills on sacred lands threaten cultural identity. Petroglyph Im imagery uh, also supports the work of Diné artist Emmy Whitehorse's uh, uh, work as connected to the sacred landscape. Whitehorse grew up close to Chaco Canyon in an area that offered material and cultural sustenance for her family. Gathering plants and seeds with her grandmother to make dyes and medicines led to her to, as Kathleen Ash Milby has put it, comprehend abstract concepts of life force, healing, and achieving harmony with the universe, a connection that was made more valuable during years away from her homeland at boarding school. Whitehorse's work incorporates this understanding of land using a palette that draws on the geological colors of the landscape and the dyes derived from plants. Visual forms um, in her work include not only petroglyphs, but also representations of seed pods, leaves, and other organic elements dispersed across the surface of large sheets of paper that are worked flat on the ground with diverse mediums. The layers of color and imagery on the surfaces of White Horse's art are in dialogue with Navajo weaving and with the ways in which the weaver's work includes a sequence of steps that keeps the land in mind, from raising sheep to gathering materials for dyes to setting up a loom by a window or outside. Quote, my grandmother, being a weaver, would collect plants and would have all these plants drying, hanging on the wall, and it was the most beautiful sight and the smell of it when it was drying. Whitehorse's work also incorporates ordinary iconography and commercial images, as well as weaving tools and geometric shapes connected to weaving and basketry designs, as well as letters and phonemes from the Navajo language. Whole words sometimes appear, offering a message to those of her, readers who, of her viewers who can read them. She has said that she wants to remind Navajo kids, quote, that they were important. Their language, culture, their way of seeing was important. Embedding the words into these layered surfaces of her work, she fuses language, worldview, and the land that is their constant reference. Whitehorse's commitments are assertions of cultural sovereignty. The perpetuation of the indigenous language and lifeways are inseparable from indigenous access to, control of, ancestral land. In these struggles, as we have heard, the relationship to land is not one of property that can allow for the transfer of ownership and exchange of one plot for another. Dakota intellectual and theologian Vine Deloria posited that the settler colonial worldview is organized around time, while indigenous epistemological thought is centered on place. For Deloria, settlers see the land as a site of developmental achievements that made them masters and guardians of the material world a point of view that creates an inherent divide and hierarchical relationship between human beings and the land. By contrast, place structural tribal identity as past events and revelations are recalled by repeated ceremonial practices at the very sites where they occurred. And revelations are recalled by, um, and, sorry, occurred, maintaining and updating the relationship to land continually. 
Quote, it was not what people believed to be true that was important, but what they experienced as true. Hence, revelation was seen as a continuous process of adjustment to the natural surroundings and not as a specific message valid for all times and places, as Western religion would have it. Writing in the 1970s, Deloria spoke about Native American thought generally, but of course it is vital to understand that the hundreds of distinct tribal nations within North America have distinct ways of considering and interacting with their own sacred landscapes. In the arid Southwest, as Silko's words remind us, traces of the generations who came before surround contemporary people and instruct them on how to survive because, because they've been preserved. Coche de Pueblo Potter, Diego Romero, gives visual form to this. Much of his work is devoted to depicting contemporary Pueblo life, but he grounds these works in the past through multiple connections, drawing imagery from ancestral pottery, showing the remains of ancestors under the ground upon which contemporary figures stand, and retracing ancient potters' activities by using their same materials and techniques, gathered in the same clay kilns. His recent Boy in the Anthropocene I don't know why I'm having so much trouble. There we go. Um, encircles a current vision of the world with a ring of stylized plants that bring the mutually sustaining relationship between people and their land into clear view. Many indigenous communities operate in a way contemporary Diné indigenous studies scholar Glenn Coltard describes as being essentially and, and vitally informed by land, or as he states, by what the land as a mode of reciprocal relationship, which is itself informed by place-based practices and associated forms of knowledge, ought to teach us about living our lives in relation to one another and our surroundings in a respectful, non-dominating, and non-exploitative way. Coltard refers to this ethical framework as grounded normativity. The struggles to preserve Bears Ears and Chaco and Standing Rock and many other places sacred to indigenous peoples are supported by environmentalists who also oppose exploitation of the natural world. But, and this has been referenced in uh, some of the preceding talks, while grounded normativity offers an alternative conceptualization of relationships to land that are much needed in this time of global environmental crisis, it would be wrong to appropriate indigenous art for broader environmentalist movements at the cost of losing a sense of the specificity of continuously maintained tribal relationships with specific homelands that inform their point of view lest environmentalism endorse indigenous dispossession in the name of preserving nature, as has happened so frequently in the preservation of public lands. Certainly, there are many examples of clashes between indigenous communities and environmentalists. I just brought in a reference to uh, whaling in the Northwest Coast, right? Um, uh, the legal battle over whaling rights of the Macan Nation of Washington State in this struggle, environmentalists argue that the Macaw no longer need whales for food and should not hunt endangered species, but the Macaw counter that whales feed their spirit and that marine hunting rights are so important to their cultural identity that their ancestors fought to have them included in the nation's 1854 treaty with the United States. Whales sacrificing themselves to meet the needs of the human community is understood as an essential aspect of the reciprocal relationships between the two species. For Diné artist Will Wilson, as for the other artists I've discussed, care for the material world holds sacred continuity with care for human community. Wilson makes pictures that envision a sense of nourishing, even healing, aimed at both the land and the people that comprise his community in the face of environmental damage caused by the extraction industries. His monumental 2005 installation, Autoimmune Response, depicts a landscape well known to settler viewers through Western films and sublime landscape paintings like the Moran um, oil painting on the right. Uh, so, um, and yet, um, those Western representations show an alienated, commodified relationship to the Diné sacred landscape. And of course, the Grand Canyon is sacred to many of the indigenous tribes of this region. Art historian Nancy K. Anderson has specifically read Thomas Moran's work as an articulation of the value of the West as a resource, 
quote, skillfully crafted and consciously composed for a market interested in the West, often as an investment, most Western landscapes carried a conciliatory message implying that the natural and technological sublime were compatible that the wilderness landscape Americans had used to define themselves and their nation since the 17th century could endure as a capital icon when being converted to economic use. On the Navajo reservation, this attitude led to extensive mining that continues um, by settlers whose ability to enter tribal land and remove its mineral wealth faced only the slightest federal barriers. This exploitation was made more damaging because of the fact that the reservation, covering 27,425 square miles, or over 7 million hectares, spanning the intersection of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah, we saw some maps, maybe you have a sense of that, um, contains rich deposits of uranium, oil, and coal. According to the US EPA, from 1944 to 1986, nearly 30 million tons of uranium ore were extracted from Navajo lands. And in this work, a largely Navajo workforce was exposed to radioactive materials. And uh, Angelo's grandmother tells a story of, of some of the kinds of things that the extraction industry has done to, to family and continuity. Um, the mines, both before and after being abandoned, have leached toxic chemicals into the ground where it contaminates the water used for drinking and agriculture. In 1979, a tailings pond designed to contain nuclear waste near the town of Church Rock breached its dam, spilling more than 1,000 tons of toxic materials into the Rio Puerco River in a disaster that was worse than the one occurring four months earlier at Three Mile Island plant in Pennsylvania, though it received much less coverage in the news. Wilson's work seems to make reference to this. Um, the impact of this history on the health of Navajo people, their animals, and their crops has been devastating. And in 2005, the tribal government banned all mining on their territory. And now, of course, in Bears Ears, what's being fought is mining on um, territory that's not legally granted as part of the Navajo reservation, but obviously is part of their, um, of their territory nonetheless. It was only in February of 2017, after decades of court claims, that a settlement was reached forcing former mine owners uh, and the federal government to clean up the damage from uranium mining. And I haven't actually um, checked into how that's doing in this current moment. Wilson's work responds empathetically to the damage that this history has done to this land and his people. In this black and white picture, he stands, oh, in, sorry, in this black and white picture, he stands in a flooded field wearing a gas mask. You just saw it. Um, creating a sense of identification between vulnerable human and vulnerable land. Wilson's references to images like Moran's is deliberate. He wrote that he, quote, wanted to appropriate images and pre-contextualize what was going on in them, coding them as relative before they were resource. Um, and in his, I really want to go back. Can I go back one more? There we go. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in the way in which this image um, fractures the space through the sequence of, um, of photographs that are patched together, they're cobbled together. Um, and I think breaking up that landscape in this disjointed but overlapping way um, really serves to give us uh, a, a, an approximation of the embodied existence of looking around. Importantly, Wilson's project includes not only chilling indications of ecocide and genocide, but also a representation of the Navajo's work to promote healing through an adaptation of ancient tools, such as the sprinkling of pollen during prayer, and also, and this is his work at the bottom here, um, a cyber hogan where humans and plants are regenerated using up-to-date technology within an ancestral sacred architectural structure. And these are just a couple of examples of, um, of other hogans up top, uh, a, a 19th century one and another very contemporary one. As Rena Swensel and J.J. Brody have pointed out in a study of ancestral Pueblo pottery, quote, one way a people may project and share their vision of the world around them is to create pictorial art. This is as true in the present as it was in the past. Jean Quick to see Smith's words might be a good place to end. Even after Indians have lived in an urban environment for two generations, they still refer to tribal land as home. This continuum is made tenable by many factors. 
Each tribe's total culture is immersed in its specific area. Traditional foods, ceremonies, and art come from the indigenous plants and animals, as well as the land itself. The anthropomorphism of the land spawns stories and myths. These are the stuff of culture which keep identity intact. Thank you. So it's a special pleasure for me now to invite Catherine Belzowski, who is a senior attorney of the Navajo Nation, Department of Justice. Please. Thanks. I'd like to thank Professor Hutchison for going after Angelo, someone who's gone after him in other presentations. It is not easy, so thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Catherine Balzowski. I'm a senior attorney at the Navajo Nation Department of Justice. I'm here on behalf of Attorney General uh, Ethel Branch. I'd like to thank the Italian Academy for having, uh, having me here today. I am, am a non-native. I'm actually um, about a quarter Italian. And it was my grandmother who was full Italian who always told me, when I was being brought up, always told me stories about the struggle that she had endured as a child of an immigrant, and the you know the no don't hire Italian signs, all the um, teasing that she endured as being being a Italian speaker, and she always told me these stories not just to instill this value, you know, the sense of what we struggle that our family went through when we first came to this country, but also to always say, and that's why you always have to fight for others because. We, just as we struggled, you have a responsibility to help other people who are new to this country and whatnot. Um, and I think she'd be really excited to have the Italian Academy sponsor something of this nature because it was through her, or her influence that led me into this career path. Um, I always have to kind of pay, for, pay back, pay forward, pay somehow. Um, so anyway, uh, I see if I can figure out the technology. So um, I work for the Navajo Nation Department of Justice. This is the Navajo Nation in its entirety, about the size of West Virginia. It's quite large. Um, where I work is called Window Rock, which is the bottom part um, of the, the screen, which is quite a ways away from the Utah area. But I wanted to show this because I think a lot in the discussion of Bears Ears, there's a lot of talk of Utah Navajos, you know, versus other Navajos. And it's important always to start the discussion with that the Navajo people are one people, whether they may reside on the Arizona portion of the reservation, the New Mexico or the Utah side. And when the Navajo uh, Nation government speaks, it speaks on behalf of all its members, not just members located in certain areas. Um, so this is the Navajo Nation Department of Justice, where I spend my days. Um, it's obvious, like I said, it's located in Window Rock, Arizona, which I always enjoyed giving these presentations, especially when I know Angelo is going to be speaking, because he his video is a reminder. Sometimes when we work in the government, as anyone who works in social governments probably is aware, you kind of get lost from the fight a little bit of what you're fighting for. And so it's always nice to be refreshed by his presentation and his videos of you know why we, we the government, you know, and the attorneys are carrying out these fights and what's really at stake here. Um, the Navajo Nation Department of Justice, is, to kind of give you a little background, we're the only department of uh, in-house tribal um, Department of Justice. We're modeled after the U.S. Department of Justice, so there's about 20 in-house attorneys that the nation employs, and we represent the nation on many different matters. I'm in what's called the litigation unit, and that's how I'm involved in the Bears Ears, um, because I'm one of the attorneys who filed the complaint against Trump on behalf of the nation. There's other attorneys who do everything from natural resources to economic development to taxation issues. But it's a very unique setup and it's, imp it's interesting to note that the nation is the only um, party representing itself. We didn't, we're not using outside attorneys, not that there's anything wrong with the outside attorneys, they're very brilliant. Um, but the nation feels that it's important to try to represent itself and have its attorneys represent it uh, represented in as many issues as possible. 
Um, I'm actually, there's not as many, even though I happen to be a non-native, I'm, I'm unique. There's actually, it's primarily made up of Navajo attorneys. So that's something that we are proud of at the nation. Um, so San Juan County. So as we looked back, um, you, oh, I guess you can't, well, I broke it. Oh, okay, so when we were looking earlier at the map, uh, the map on the right, uh, the pink area, that's the Navajo Nation. Um, and that's a part of the, uh, about as much of uh, the San Juan County. The, all the different colors, you can't see because it's really small writing, um, show the different dispersion of population throughout San Juan County. And as you can tell, the a majority of the native population in San Juan County is on the Navajo Reservation um, at the bottom part of the county. And this is, doesn't quite do the same justice as the video, the movie that we just watched, but here are some beautiful parts of Bears Ears. So Bears Ears isn't technically on the Navajo Nation. It's actually on the part of the land just a little north of what is the formal Navajo Nation reservation boundary. But as Angela talked about in his presentation, the Bears Ears land is part of the ancestral territory of the Navajo people. And so even though the, it's not within our formal reservation, there's a lot of ties that the Navajo people have to this area. And that's something that, um, and it's not just the, um, Navajo people that reside in the state of Utah, but it's also all the Navajo people, because as Angela talked about, you know, very important historical figures were born in Bears Ears. There's a lot of ceremonies that reference this land. And so people throughout the Navajo Nation are, you know, singing these songs and referencing this area when they're performing these ceremonies. So that's why when we talk about, you know, we talk about Bears Ears, we talk about the importance to all the, to all the people um, of the Navajo Nation. So San Juan County is a very interesting place. As someone who's not originally from the San Juan County area or the Southwest, I'm originally from um, Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I moved out, and when I moved out here, I had to learn a lot about the local history because there's so much of the history that influences the issues that we're having today. A part of, in conjunction with the Bears Ears case, we also have a voting rights case currently against San Juan County, and they're very intertwined. And without knowing the long history of the relationship between the native people and the non-natives in the county, a lot of this stuff can kind of seem disjointed or it doesn't really make sense. Um, and so it's important to note that like, you know, all the, you know, resistance that we've been getting in the Bears Ears case, a lot of that, the language is stuff that's been built up over, you know, decades and centuries of discrimination against the native population in San Juan County. It's not like it just came out of the blue. It's something that's been there and the nation has brought repeated cases against San Juan County in many different circumstances trying to, you know, get them to provide adequate roads, schools on the reservation to native children, um, paving roads so that buses can, um, you know, pick kids up for school. And there's all, you know, and in doing this, we've always had to fight, we've always had to file lawsuits, basically. We've always had to push and push. Uh, even if it's for, you know, for the right to vote. There's been numerous voting litigations, including cases brought by the U.S. government against San Juan County, which was settled in the late 1980s, saying, you know, you county, because what the county used to have is they used to have a countywide voting system, which really discriminated against Native peoples, and we couldn't, you know, Native peoples weren't getting elected. And so then they instituted, with the settlement of this case, uh, what's called commission districts. And that has led to its own set of problems, which we then had to go back to court because after they set these districts in the 80s, they never felt like they ever needed to change the districts as pursuant to Utah law. So that has been a fun, fun times. And I will talk a little bit more about this. So, you know, not only is there discrimination within the um, you know, just culturally and within the society. There's also the political discrimination, like in the voting rights case. And so this is one of the, in the past election, this was a statement made in the local newspaper by Bruce Adams, who is running for um, commissioner against uh, Mr. William Gray Eyes, who was opponent. And I think um, as someone who, att I attended a lot, not a lot, but I did attend um, 
some meetings between the federal judge and the county in the regards to the voting rights case. And when those meetings were happening, it was a lot of these comments that were being made by the local population. Well, why should we expend our resources on the nation? You know, that's not our job. Our money shouldn't go there. We should just build a wall. And so, you know, let them do, you know, let them live their, do their thing. We're not responsible for them. And that's, a, you know, and this is just within, well, 2012, so it's, you know, just within the past several years that these kind of comments, you know, they're still being made. And this is the mentality in regards to Bears Ears. Like, if you're going in to this community that already has a long history of suppressing Native rights and Native votes, you know, the idea of creating a monument that's going, that does all things, you know, that's a Native monument that was brought by the people the native people of that community that was supported by the five tribes, you know, it's, it breaks their brains. Um, so, but it's also important um, because the whole, as you'll see, the voting issue ties into this whole Bears Ears conversation. And so this is a, a, a lovely map. It shows the original monument as designated by Obama. And then it shows what uh, the current status of the monument is under the Trump, po the Trump proclamation. So you can see the massive loss in land under the Trump proclamation. So once, a tr once tr Trump, I guess it's like, my mind does not want to say his name, it's not allowing me. Once Trump issued his proclamation in December of last year, the tribes which had been actively involved in the campaign to not have him do this, um, we filed a complaint. So this complaint was made up of the coalition tribes that Raleigh had mentioned earlier th today, um, Hopi, Zuni, uh, Ute Mountain, Ureut, and Navajo Nation. And so we quickly, we had, you know, because we knew that this was coming, we were able to quickly file our, our complaint. And so I just want to kind of go over what some of the, you know, what is this complaint arguing? And basically it's all about the Antiquities Act that Angelo mentioned in his presentation. And it's actually a very fast, from a lawyer's perspective, it's very fascinating. Um, but I don't want you guys to go to sleep because this is a dark room and it is after lunch. So um, I'll try to keep it as interesting as possible. So we have four claims. So we're making four arguments in the complaint. And the first argument has to do with the Antiquities Act. And basically what the tribes are arguing is that the Antiquities Act is only a one-way power give. It's not... Uh, it doesn't give the president anything besides the authority to designate monuments. And we'll see in a minute why that's important. And so the, that, so the language of the Antiquities Act as it was passed in 1906 is very important for this matter. So I just wanted to bring it up on this slide. Um, and it's interesting because if you actually Google the Antiquities Act, the way that it's been codified in the USCs, they actually um, changed, a, they kind of tweaked it to make it clearer. Um, so if you are ever interested in looking at this issue further, I would recommend looking at the original text of the Antiquities Act as passed in 1906 and not the one that's kind of, they ended up like separating it into different numbers and it doesn't read exactly how it was passed. Um, but for our purposes for this case, we're very interested in the exact language as it was passed in 1906. And the whole crux of the argument is that in Section 2 of the Antiquities Act, it states that the president is hereby authorized in his discretion to declare by public proclamation, and then it lists um, you know, landmarks, historic and prehistoric structures, other objects of historic or scientific interest that are situated upon lands owed by the government of the United States, again, something else that Angela had pointed out, all the lands that are part of the Bears Ears Monument were all federal lands. There are no private lands that were at issue because the Antiquities Act doesn't even allow for that. Um, and the president may reserve as part thereof parcels of land and limits um, in which all cases shall be confined to the smallest area compatible with proper care and management of the objects to be protected. So in looking at this, nothing in here says that the pre that the president can resend, he can modify, he can withdraw. It only says that he can designate. And why that's important is because yeah, um, under the second claim, there, 
It's a separation of powers. And then the third claim talks about the properties clause. So the president on his own doesn't have the authority to do what he wants with public land. Under the Constitution, that authority resides in Congress. So the president can only mess around with public land when Congress gives him the authority to do it. And so that's why you know the exact language of the Antiquities Act is really important, because he, he can only do what's been given to him. And if he hasn't, Congress hasn't given him the authority to modify, resend, change national monuments, then how is, what is he doing, right? And so the tribes are arguing that based on the plain language of the Antiquities Act, the president cannot take this action uh, that he did in 2017. And, you know, and then we talk about the separation of powers, um, in the Constitution that says, you know, all legislative powers are vested in Congress. So basically the president, by doing this action, which the Antiquities Act does not, plain language does not say he can do, he's violating the separation of powers. He's basically creating new law. And that is only something that Congress can do. And under the third claim has to do with the property clause, which gives um, Congress the sole authority to, um, dispose and make needful rules and regulations in respect to the property of the United States. So again, the president's limited, right? And you know, one, and we haven't had any um, response of pleadings, so we filed this complaint back in December of 2017, and the only thing the U.S. has filed is what's called a motion for change of venue, in which they want to bring the case, they want to have the case transferred from the D.C. court to Utah. Uh, and the tribes have opposed it and we're just waiting for the court to rule on it. And so at this time, they haven't filed an answer or any kind of motion to dismiss, so we're not clear you know, what their arguments will be for the allegations we made in our complaint. But I suspect that they're going to have to make an argument to the extent of, you know, they're gonna have to read in the language, right? Like they have to read it in because of the plain language doesn't clearly say, you president can also do X, Y, Z, then you have to infer it. So you have to say, well, it may not say exactly this, but you, we infer that he has this prow power, that he has this right. And so it's very interesting because at the same time that the Antiquities Act was passed, I think just a couple years, if I'm right, just a couple years earlier, another act regarding the forest was passed. And in that act, Congress did give the president authority to rescind and revoke and modify forest, national forest designations. So, you know, it's going to be this whole, you know, interpreting what did Congress mean in 1906 when they passed the Antiquities Act and you know, how should you, Supreme Court, who's never looked at this issue, how should you interpret it? So in that sense, it's very fascinating. I wish it wasn't happening in regards to Bears ears, but um, it is, you know, at least from a lawyer's perspective, this is um, as close to you know, just straight statutory and constitutional interpretation as you can get. And then our fourth claim that we, has to do with the Administrative Procedures Act or the APA. And what this claim talks about is this one, the first, second, and third claim are directed towards the president. You, president, have acted outside your authority of what Congress has given to you. You've acted outside the authority of the Constitution. And our fourth claim is directed towards the secretaries, the secretaries of the agencies that are in charge of managing the monument. And basically saying, you secretaries, you haven't done what you're supposed to be doing under the Obama proclamation. And therefore, you're unlawfully uh, withholding your duties. So. Not only, and that's why it's not only um, the case isn't just versus President Trump, it's also versus the Secretary of Interior and the Secretary of Agriculture. And so, President, you shouldn't have done this. And by the way, you secretaries, you need to do what the Obama proclamation said you're supposed to do. Um, and so this is a great cartoon from the Salt Lake Tribune. Um, and so this kind of goes back to the voting, the voting rights case, so kind of tying that back into this. So part of the discussion and a lot, what happened back in, I think in April of this year, that's when Trump said, hey, Zinke, I want you to review all these monuments over a certain size that were designated after a certain year. 
And so Zinke went out across the nation and you know, listened to the local concerns. And it's very interesting on who those local concerns were, because one of the big issues the Navajo Nation had, at least, is that we were not getting responses. So we would email, we'd send letters, we'd send emails, we'd ask for meetings, and we weren't being consulted. And the amount of time that was given to the nation and the five tribes in general was just a fraction of what was given to what Zinke deemed to be the local population or the representatives of the local government. So who was that? It was the county commissioners, right? But the county commissioners, just with, while, this, while he's consulting with these county commissioners, a federal court in Salt Lake City is literally issuing orders saying, these county commissioners have been elected in unconstitutional districts. Their districts have been gerrymandered, they're not constitutional, and ordering new elections come November 2018 for all, all the districts. And putting in place new districts because the county was trying to redraw the districts, but they kept redrawing them in ways that were unconstitutional. So the court said, you know, just stop. I'm going to figure this out. Um, so the people that Zinke were listen listening to were people who were holding off office in districts that weren't even legal. So they weren't even representing the, you know, the local population. And that's why the, the voting case and the Bears years go hand in hand, because if we had had, I, I believe this, if we had had um, voting districts that were constitutional in the past couple of elections, I don't think that the representatives at the local level would have been so adverse to the Bears years monument. And what you saw in places like New Mexico, where the local population was actually really supportive of the monuments that were under Zinke, Zinke's review, is you didn't see Zinke take action against them. So you saw, you know, in New Mexico, they had a lot of local leaders, you know, have meetings, say really positive thing about these monuments, and nothing, you know, nothing ever happened. Not to say, you know, this is kind of. It's hard to say this may have happened either way, but I think it would have been a lot harder based on the recommendations, because when Zinke did his recommendations to Trump on what to do with these monuments, he said, uh, you know, he referenced this local population, these local people who haven't been heard, who've, whose voices haven't been heard, but it's all about how you define who's the local population. Um, so the Navajo Nation is, you know, we're gonna continue to fight for this, and I, it's very, again, it's always, it's always great to listen to Angela talk because it always reminds me, you know, why we're fighting because it's not just the government thinking this is something we need to do. It's that, you know, the whole monument has been a, a grassroots endeavor. It's been by the people, the Navajo people of Utah. They're the ones who've said this is something we need. And it's really fascinating because I believe it was after and there's been a, a lot of looting in that area decades of looting that's happened and there's been several studies that have come, academic papers that have come out about you know the phenomenon the like huge phenomenon of looting in San Juan County and like the way that the people in the local area conceptualize it and make it okay and justify it and it was after this that the people the native population in San Juan County were like enough like this is enough we need to have this area protected and so, you know, them driving the conversation, driving this effort, and then we as the government just coming in to support them, which I think is, um, you know, how it should be. It should be the people telling us what we need, you know, what is their priorities, and then us coming in. And so it's very, um, I don't, not, not frustrating per se, but when you see like the article, you know, articles coming out about like, well, the local Navajos don't want this, and this is just a window rock thing, it's so funny because if the local population in Utah, Navajo people in Utah hadn't wanted this, you know, Window Rock wouldn't have taken this up on their own sua sponte. So it could, just couldn't be farther from the truth. And I'm really proud to be a part of this case and hopefully it'll be a winner. So thanks. I would now like to invite Kevin Madalena, uh, Pueblo de Jebez, New Mexico, Utah Diné, Bikea, Community Outreach Coordinator, Field Researcher, Geologist, and Paleontologist. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. 
and um, uh, esteemed guest uh, uh, leadership and the Italian Academy and Columbia University. I am grateful uh, to be an honored guest here and uh, the greatest honor is sharing what we have with you from uh, the Pope of Hamas. And my talk today is, uh, as a paleontologist, uh, I'd like to uh, delve personally into what we say uh, in New Mexico that uh, that we literally stand in two worlds. Uh, my left foot, you know, is in the traditional indigenous, I believe, and my right foot is into the uh, what the old ones uh, in Hamas call the uh, uh, the outside people world, where it's a more uh, empirical knowledge, but also traditional knowledge at the same time, as uh, as Angelo and et al. Uh, have uh, pointed out as well. So my talk is called uh, the the paleoarchaeology and geology of the ancient Puebloans of the of the Beers Ears National Monument. And I, love, I, I also like to thank uh, Utah Dene Bouquet as well, and here's a, here's a group uh, photo of us at the University of Utah. Here, here's a map of, of uh, this, this section right here the, that shows the, the, uh, the ancestral routes uh, uh, of the migration routes of the, uh, of the transition ruins uh, from the archaic or Used to be called the Fremont Age. This is right after right after the Ice Age, around uh, 12,000 uh, years or uh, or 9,000 BC. Uh, I I we get a lot of questions why uh, this entire area is actually uh, like the uh, barren. Uh, here's Nevada, uh, Utah, and Colorado. Uh, uh, this line right here, uh, all the way up north, uh, uh, why it's there's no record of a. Um, <laughs> There's no record of any natives back then. Well, it, it was the Ice Age. Uh, that further down south, uh, you had in, like enormous glaciers had uh, had migrated down south. So there's no, uh, uh, there's obviously no gonna, going to be no record. Uh, uh, if any of you are uh, Game of Thrones fans, uh, this is what the ice wall looked like, uh, literally, <laughs> in the literal sense. Um, uh, the the Bears Ears National Monument, the Grand Syracuse Escalante, and the Greater Chalker Region. Uh, to the present uh, locations of the contemporary Pueblos and the Kiowa Nation, uh, we are we are direct descendants. Um, uh, I just recently uh, um, uh, I, I suffered uh, kind of the same fate uh, as uh, a scientist that specializes in one region, uh, uh, just the Colorado Plateau. Uh, I you know uh, unbeknownst, I didn't realize the Kiowa the Kiowa Nation are direct uh, descendants from uh, Hamas Pueblo as well. So there's, uh, there's only two uh, Tanawan language uh, uh, speakers left, uh, which are uh, the Pueblo of Hamas and Kiowa. The Colorado Plateau is uh, still the original and geographic of uh, 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 this section right here, the Colorado Plateau, is, is still the it's still the the geographic uh, location of uh, of the the uh, of the of the, Pue of the Pueblo people, and. Um, uh, just by coincidence, uh, the, uh, the the Col the Colorado the Colorado Plateau, uh, being geologically and geographically complex together, uh, uh, I, I kind of felt the uh, you know it, it just a serendipity that uh, um, as complex as as nations that we are, that uh, we also belong to that complex piece of uh, uh, real estate that's uh, left over from the age of dinosaurs. <laughs> Uh, with the Archaic Age or the Fremont Age, the, uh, uh, with the recent archaeology uh, uh, advancements, uh, the, uh, since I'm more of a paleontologist, uh, people are, uh, I'm learning more as well. <laughs> uh, uh, people are, are, are really, at, the, at my recent past, uh, people were not really my forte, but uh, with the urgency of, uh, of recent developments of uh, uh, protecting the ancestral lands, uh, it was absolutely imperative that uh, I, I evolve, uh, literally, uh, to expand my uh, no knowledge base of, uh, of the evolution of uh, ent entire um, uh, societies of people. Uh, with, uh, with, with the, the archaic and Fremont age, uh, they're, they're uh, synonymous now, and to the early basket maker ages, here, here is um, uh, what the, uh, the ancestral of, of Pueblo once hunted. Uh, uh, th there's petroglyphs right here uh, uh, that consist of the American Mastodon and the American Mammoth, and 
And with the figurines in the basket, uh, uh, they're discovered in the oldest uh, uh, Apobo ruins over there by Salt Lake City, uh, which belongs to the Apobo of Zuni, actually, uh, that have that age, that carbon age of 9,000 BC. Uh, um, right, I don't have any pictures right now of, uh, of uh, some of the war kachinas and uh, uh, ancient Puebloans uh, hunting mammoths, as uh, I do not have permission uh, for the non secular uh, leaderships. Uh, 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 the, the, old, the oldest kivas um, are still very active as the spring equinox uh, approaches us. Uh, many of them are, are actively using the altars within the Bears Ears National Monument and the Grand Staircase Escalante, and along with the Greater Chaco area as well. So, so it's, it's kind of, we live in an extraordinary time that we're slowly uh, kind of leaking and sharing uh, the, this very sensitive information um, uh, due to the urgency of, uh, of, of, of uh, the, co the contemporary times and uh, we're trying to do the, con the conservation. Along with the Fremont Age, uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, there are the Pueblo uh, uh, with, with, the, with the potatoes and the maize right here, the, the agrarian technology uh, began to uh, uh, appear along with the min uh, min minerals uh, and the, the natural ochres were being uh, experimented with to for a literal, literal, literal survival, um, with, with, with the recent discovery of, uh, of maize and, and the, uh, uh, the potatoes, uh, the, uh, the ancient potato, uh, uh, you know, the, the evolution uh, with, uh, by recent advancements uh, from the uh, 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 from the Pueblo altars, uh, the, this agrarian technology appeared. Uh, so, uh, so, so these crops can be. Uh, um, um, drought and pest resistant, uh, and uh, we're lucky that Utah Dene Bikea is actually um, promote, promoting with the Natural Foods uh, Directive uh, uh, that, that Ms. Cynthia Wilson is, is uh, uh, heading up that department. With the archaic, th uh, these are the archaic Pueblo ruins within the Bears Ears National Monument. Uh, the picture right here is, uh, this is a, uh, a west of uh, Blanding, Utah. This is Butler Wash Pueblo. And uh, uh, with, the, with the new uh, ages as well, with the, with the BCE before Common Era, uh, this is the uh, pre, uh, this is nearly about a millennia before uh, European contact. Uh, this, this Pueblo had a, a, a two, a two kivas and a, a, a two, uh, two granaries uh, uh, with, with some houses down at the, at the bottom of the wash right here. And these, uh, uh, this level of um, uh, of the pueblos are, are I think, uh, as a modern Hamas uh, man, uh, um, it, it strongly resembles where the where the non secular leaderships uh, probably uh, uh, lived. As yeah, the, these small houses, uh, uh, um, uh, there's the location of a small kiva right here. Uh, the, the close proximity of uh, of uh, these houses to these uh, holy altars. Uh, so, uh, so it's based on an older design. Uh, whereas, if you see around kivas in ruins, that uh, that's a more older design as the contemporary pueblos, uh, like us in New Mexico, and uh, we uh, we have evolved into the more rectangular uh, square uh, uh, variant. Just about 20 miles down south of uh, Blanding, Utah, we have a. Uh, 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 when I used, to, I used to be a paleontologist with the Bureau of Land Management in a Moab, uh, um, uh, the, these kivas right here, and you can see the petroglyphs that are still intact right here. Uh, this is maybe about 500 years uh, 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 younger than uh, uh, the the Pueblo in Butler Wash. Uh, with the petroglyphs right here, um, uh, you, you have these uh, uh, these cutting areas. And uh, I'm I'm really uh, kind of kicking myself. Uh, I took this picture, just right, uh, just right um, uh, next to the picture. Uh, there was a, a, a dinosaur footprint uh, that was posted uh, uh, along with the deities. Uh, it's a large three-toed uh, 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 carnivore um, that was uh, placed upon that hearth uh, and and um, uh, a cutting area, meaning that the that the that the, the old Puebloans uh, they they were familiar with the uh, with the extinct biota, and uh, they, they knew about the fossils and dinosaurs as well, along with the with the present bison and uh, elk and and uh, deer that they were hunting. So they they were uh, so we know for a fact 
uh, even in the in the more recent pueblos uh, that, uh, that that the worlds uh, before us uh, they they existed uh, because uh, I was told by the non secular leaderships uh, uh, we were all not meant to be, live together. Oops, I went, back. I went too uh, fast with the time machine here. Uh, the Comb Ridge ruins uh, uh, where uh, we saw uh, um, we saw a, a beautiful uh, uh, panoramic shot from uh, uh, Angelo's drone, uh, which uh, I can't come close to right now. <laughs> um, yeah, the, yeah the, these houses right here. Uh, the, this is the fire the firehouse, and this is the uh, uh, the butterfly cave. Uh, 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 ruins. Uh, uh, these are uh, a little bit uh, 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 more younger as, as far as the, the Butler Wash uh, um, uh, Pueblo ruins as as when I used the term uh, 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 transition uh, ruins. Uh, uh, you, you can literally, in, in the literal sense, uh, we see the the, the older po the Pueblos um, are, are they're transitioning and evolving more into the uh, uh, you know, the cross hybridization, the cross pollination, and the extraction of the the, of the geology around uh, for for their uh, different colors for their uh, pots pots and art. You know, whether clay clay is used for uh, like manganese and iron uh, for for the natural colors. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, the 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 older pueblos down in the Grand Staircase Escalante, they're uh, they're actually beginning to leave instructions how to cross pollinate plants just in case. Uh, an enormous drought uh, comes through, uh, so they're leaving instructions uh, behind for their descendants, and how 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 to how to make uh, you know, your harvest more drought resistant and pest resistant. So you know it, this is probably in poor taste, but uh, the, but my, my ancestors uh, they they're really engineering the first GMOs. Uh, <laughs> Here's the surface geology of, of the Bears Ears National Monument. Uh, here are the Bears Ears itself uh, from my vantage point. Uh, we're uh, doing uh, a field work. And this is Mexican Hat, um, maybe about 30 miles uh, south of uh, the Bears Ears proper. Uh, you can see the, the, the complex ge uh, geology right here. Uh, here is a chain of, uh, uh, of a little uh, uh, a pointy uh, 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 structural geology we, we call a anticline. So, um, so we have uh, the entire comb ridge sticking up, uh, uh, st straight up like this. Uh, that's called the uh, a mon a mon a monocline. So, I, uh, uh, Mr. Malcolm Lehigh had uh, tried to educate me what those words are in Ute, but uh, in fashion, uh, since any other language are different than yours, I promptly forgot. <laughs> so, so there's the so there's other geologic structures in that complex. Uh, er uh, uh, the, since the Colorado Plateau is a is a giant piece of uh, a, ch a chunk of real estate left over from the uh, Mesozoic era, uh, that's the age of dinosaurs. Uh, you ex uh, you can easily expect that the same complexity that is surrounding the structures that are holding up the uh, the Colorado Plateau. So so you have these uh, structures called the monocline, anticline, and a syncline. Uh, a syncline is just a big a giant bowl. Uh, this one in San Ysidro, New Mexico, we can see from US 550. Uh, Comb Ridge is one of the largest structures in, uh, on this continent about the monocline. And, uh, uh, and, these, and these anticlines, I was talking about these structures um, with all, all the red as well. Uh, they, they all kind of go uh, together like peas and carrots. Uh, as the, as the, the anticlines, they, they drag up uh, uh, minerals from gravity, from the, uh, from the faulting. So the, the, the old ones uh, also uh, uh, left instructions uh, for which uh, 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 areas of the structural geology you can look for for minerals and uh, uh, other house, house building projects uh, so you can you know, shelter yourself better. So these are the mineral resources of the archaic Pueblo age uh, to the uh, present Pueblo age five. Uh, Pueblo age five is like the present, like this very moment right now. <laughs> uh, from 9,000 BC to the present. Uh, so let me take a step back, uh, my, my apologies. Uh, with the Fremont age and the Archaic age, they're, di they're separated from different ages, uh, from 9,000 BC to, uh, to 1,000 BC. And then there is the uh, basket maker age that goes from 1,000 BC to uh, uh, 0 AD. And then the, the, the Pueblo ages one through four is from 0 AD to, uh, to the present right now. 
so uh, so Pobo H five is from uh, uh, literally from the standpoint of uh, when Coronado and De Vargas arrived in the southwest and to the present. So this is what Pobo H five is. <clears throat> This is this is a mineral called muscovite. Uh, uh, as Teresa will probably agree with me, that the, that the Sky City and uh, some of the older uh, houses uh, they use a muscovite is a is a, a large nesos, nesosilicate sheet uh, that you find in the fault lines and uh, and uh, you can see right through them. Actually, uh, they're used as windows, and they're used as the uh, uh, a part of a. a, a the traditional uh, private ceremonies uh, uh, on top of your body paint, so you can, uh, or the what you call the slang, a uh, uh, bling. <laughs> uh, so, so these are these are large sheets you can actually pop off. Uh, I, uh, as a geologist at the at Grand Canyon, I've seen the sheets as lar as uh, as large as the floor right here, or to little diminutive ones of the size of your pinky. So you can break them off and use them as windows and so forth. But the most important thing is uh, the. <clears throat> Uh, the kaolinite right here and the bentonite. The kaolinite and bentonite are called nesosilicates, and that's what they make up the badlands. Like in South Dakota, the San Juan Basin uh, in the northwest New Mexico, uh, the badlands you see like uh, I mean, in movies, uh, you, you know, uh, like in, by Pine Ridge, uh, Nebraska, Kansas. Uh, it's because of a lot of volcanism. Uh, when the potato uh, was first being uh, crossed. Uh, hybridized and cross-pollinated uh, uh, during the 1000 BC and so forth, uh, uh, they, they were being grown uh, uh, from the, uh, the the altars of the Grand Staircase Escalante and uh, the uh, the Berezers National Monument. Uh, the 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 even my uh, the uh, my great uh, grandmother told me one time that they they ate vegetables mixed in with the. Uh, mixed in with the, the two minerals of, uh, that they separated from the, the badlands, because remember that that's the only thing that's the only way the, this nesosilicate be turned into calcium. So back then, you know, in the eight, late 1800s, uh, you, 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 uh, around Sky City or or San Felipe Pueblo or Zuni or Taos or Jemez, you know, you can just you just you just can't go to the local the Dollar General and get milk. Uh, th this is the only way you can uh, mix in with your vegetables to get your uh, 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 calcium supplement. So, so basically, you're eating like a, a, a mini porridge of a, a, a clay with your vegetables, so to reinforce your mineral intake. And the altars at the the Bears Ears and the Grand Staircase. Once again, there's there's a, a, a um, instructions on how to do that as well. <clears throat> Here's the uh, uh, the present um, uh, the the Obama administration uh, with the green outline. Uh, but the, what the original designation was, and here is the, the, the kind of the profane and the obscene uh, uh, the Shasta and Indian Creek uh, 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 boundaries. Uh, the, um, as, as far as we know, the, the Obama administration, uh, 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 the proclamation is still the law of the land. And uh, uh, with the new boundaries, with the new boundaries uh, uh, that they complete. They reduce it by 85 percent. Uh, the, you know, as a, you know, as a tribal member from uh, the Pueblo of Jemez, uh, I I'm abs I'm absolutely apprehensive about you know the the fate of the uh, of of the Pueblo ancestors that are still buried out there, and also the the data, the empirical knowledge of uh, what's in geology and vertebrate paleontology that we need to kind of create our, our own algorithms uh, t to combat global warming. Global warming, the data, uh, <clears throat> it's absolutely imperative that we protect it. Uh, last month, I was one of the geologists that was, that was contacted by the U.S. military because uh, the, the Pentagon is just as weary uh, to, to help them reinforce the infrastructure of, uh, of the, in the event of the scenarios when the, uh, the glacial melt is over, overrunning the East Coast and the West Coast. As, so they're they're asking us for our data to, to so they can come up with their own uh, uh, um, infrastructure plans uh, just in case the flood of refugees uh, started going inland. So so the uh, so the in the reduced area right here, there there are over uh, 1,000 kivas uh, that still haven't been uh, as far as we know that still haven't been inventoried, and the 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 unimaginable amount of uh, uh, of the vertebrate fossil record. 
and the, the sediments that we all we collect as paleontologists uh, to, to study the pollen and uh, the little uh, uh, pill bugs or other invertebrates uh, that are very susceptible in the fossil record uh, in hopes that we can uh, uh, you know, the hopes that we can learn more uh, of uh, what the climate change was uh, uh, and apply it to the present. Also, the uh, with the uh, also with the mass migrations and the transition ruins, uh, the the climate change and the drought has also been a, a, a major factor in uh, the the the, uh, the ancestral pueblos. Uh, 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 are for, forced to move as well. So we were hoping to uh, learn about a pattern that Mother Nature has, but unfortunately with the, with the, the Trump administration, uh, with that severe reduction, uh, it's, it'll forever mutilate uh, uh, the, the fossil record and what the, what the vast instructions are still left unopened uh, in the kivas that are buried. Last but not least, uh, the contemporary uh, and the conservation efforts and advocacy are still going uh, to trying to preserve the, the old ones uh, uh, in, the, in the geological record and also the archaeological record. Uh, there, I, I wanted to share more data, uh, but I, I did not have permission from all the 19 governors uh, as a lot of it is uh, still very culturally sensitive. Uh, uh, but uh, I am happy that I could share what I could. Um, uh, with the uh, with the geologic um, uh, with with the with the geomorphology and the ge the geology that the old ones uh, used, uh, it literally was indigenous uh, knowledge that went with the current uh, scientific knowledge. <clears throat> As I, I am honored that uh, that uh, the, my colleagues uh, uh, in the larger museums are asking me what the what my what our ancestors thought of uh, in in certain cases of uh, into user data. So, so you know, so not just hard up empirical data. They're they're beginning to ask the the indigenous uh, uh, knowledge in that aspect as well. And, and just to show how far reaching the the bear, just to show how, just to demonstrate you all graphically uh, uh, what the uh, what the what the far reaches of the Bears Ears National Monument is. Uh, here, here's myself and a, and a colleague, uh, 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 Cassandra Begay, uh at the. Uh, last year's uh, uh, Bears Ears a youth uh, uh, camp and uh, the community outreach and here are, are two my two daughters right here and, and the background that's a modern day um, uh, Hamas Pueblo uh, in the background so so with, with you know with myself and Cassandra and you know the girls we're all we're all uh, this uh, descendants and uh, it affects us uh, uh, what the fate of the Bears Ears National Monument is Last but not least, uh, here is a quote I have um, uh, during the Exposure magazine that Angelo, uh, I'm pretty sure we've run out already <laughs> at, at the table on the third floor, um, which I say, the, it is my obligation as a direct descendant from the ancient Pueblo people who have our origins at the Beersish National Monument and as a scientist to protect their ruins for my children and their children. Uh, the Bears Ears has a peaceful area to come together with our contemporary siblings, the Diné and Ute people. It is common sense, decency, and respect to not harm or mutilate the footprints of our ancestors. It is also a right that monuments and public lands be protected for our fellow American citizens to be used and enjoyed by them. Uh, the Beersiers National Monument is a gathering of peace. The, the other uh, uh, little side note that I forgot to mention is the meadow on the east side of the Beersiers Mesa is, that's where all, all the 21 governors of New Mexico that was the first time uh, they, they met uh, this this um, uh, this immense civilization, the Navajo, uh, to to come uh, to come to terms with peace, and that was the it was that Bears Ears Medal. It was the first time they ever met. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to. Uh, now invite Carrie Heidman, uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln Anthropology Department and Principal Investigator and Director of the Chaco Research Archive. Please welcome. A couple of notes before I start. First is that in the program, uh, the title is declarative. <laughs> 
It's meant to be a question. <laughs> so we'll start with that. Uh, secondly, I want to introduce my co-author, Ruth Van Dyke, who's not listed in the program, but as this paper took shape, it only made sense to add her because some of the work I'm going to be speaking about um, involves um, substantially some of the work that she and I have been doing together. Um, and lastly, um, we might also subtitle this paper, Legal Observations by Non-Lawyers. And I think there's no less than three or more in the room. So. It's a dangerous place to be. <laughs> um, I also want to uh, acknowledge the native lands that we are on, and I'm really thankful uh, for this opportunity to be here with you all today. I want to thank the Italian Academy uh, for hosting this event, um, especially Dr. David Friedberg, Barbara Feda, uh, Dusan Boric, uh, Allison Jeffrey, um, uh, Baron, who helped, thank you, he's waving to me. He knows I met him because he's been really helpful to me today. Uh, it really is an honor to be here, so thanks everybody for making this happen. Um, some people in the audience might be a little bit less familiar with Chaco Canyon and the cultural heritage risks uh, associated with it. Local media outlets in the southwest have been covering the issue very closely, as you might imagine, but it has not gathered quite as much attention uh, compared to Bear's ears in national media. So we'll begin with a bit of background here. Dr. Van Dyke and I are archaeologists um, whose research focuses on Chaco. Um, but to be clear, the risks, as today's presenters have already eloquently discussed, are much, much bigger than that. And while our presentation is going to focus on the dimension that we know best, which is the archaeology, the continued expansion of oil and gas development in this region is an issue that's both created complementary and conflicting priorities, uh, including the protection of traditional cultural properties, environmental impacts, economic opportunity, health and wellness, as well as cultural heritage sites, and the list could go on for quite some time. So a thousand years ago, uh, Chaco Canyon, located in northwest New Mexico, um, was the flourishing center uh, of a Pueblo and Indian society uh, spread across the Northern American Southwest. Archaeologically, we identify this cultural horizon through a mosaic of attributes and then practices, including multi-story masonry architecture, uh, the use of particular styles of kiva and great kivas, roads or linear alignments, astronomical observation features, etc. We also tend to associate Chaco and great houses, um, and you're looking at portions of two here. Um, as having specific ceramic styles um, and through the elaborated use of materials such as shell, turquoise, lignite, and obsidian, amongst others. Uh, at its zenith, the cultural center focused on Chaco Canyon encompassed more than a dozen massive multi-story houses built of stone and wood, or what we call great houses, more than two dozen great kivas, or large subterranean, uh, subterranean um, ceremonial structures, and hundreds of smaller pueblos all crowded within a roughly two-mile stretch along the Chaco River. Much of the central precinct is today protected as a unit within the national park system known as the Chaco Culture National Historical Park. Um, and I should note that while you can't see it here, there are actually two other parcels that are discontinuous with the, um, what you're seeing there. But the Chaco in culture was far more expansive than the footprint of today's national park. It included an ancient sphere of influence as large as the state of Indiana and was comprised of about 260 offshoot communities connected in some cases through formalized roadways or linear alignments and networks of invisibility that, facilitated, uh, uh, that was facilitated through prominent elevated locations on the landscape. Um, during the 9th through 13th centuries CE, these places were settled by the ancestors of contemporary Native people and are today considered sacred places, as we've heard about from many of our speakers today. As a testimony to that fact, uh, 26 tribes serve on the Chaco Culture National Historical Park's NAGPRA Tribal Advisory Board, and you see the list of names here. Chaco Canyon has been protected as a site of national uh, patrimony since 1907 uh, and became a United Nations UNESCO World Heritage Property in 1987. And despite these protections, the greater Chacoan landscape was recently designated one of America's most endangered historic places by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Ongoing energy development in the Mecos and Gallup shale deposits of the San Juan Basin threatens our ability uh, to fully comprehend the Chaco and cultural landscape or determine what relationships existed uh, amongst the contemporaneous town and village sites that constituted the greater Chacoan world. 
The challenge of identifying, documenting, and protecting all of the cultural resources that comprise the greater Chaco landscape is magnified by a complex tapestry, and here we get to the legal stuff, uh, of legal land holding entities within this larger area. And I don't know how much of that you can see, but down here at the bottom you're seeing the color coding here for the various land um, uh, holding agencies. Um, this is a, a BLM map. Uh, the BLM Farmington Field Office, which is part of what I'm going to be talking about, um, their district actually is bigger than what's shown on this map. Um, this uh, dotted line here is this area um, of foreseeable development, uh, which is part of uh, what's at stake that I'm going to talk about, or Ruth and I are talking about, um, which encompasses both farm BLM property, but as well as other districts besides the Farmington Field Office, and as well as other jurisdictions. And I can zoom in here. A little bit. Okay. Uh, cultural resources within the discontinuous boundaries of Chaco Culture National Historical Park um, are protected, but the full extent of this ancient landscape is today managed by different agencies and individuals, as this map illustrates. The planning area, um, that's, that's the process the BLM is engaged in right now, the planning area is comprised of federal, state, and private lands, as well as Indian reservations overlying the Mancos Shale, uh, Mancos Gallup Formation. And while Dr. Van Dyke and I are not lawyers, we should point out that the situation is actually far more complicated still, given that some landowners like Navajo Alatiz uh, may own the surface rights, but the subsurface mineral rights are held in trust by the Federal Indian Minerals Office. And these are referred to as split estates. And if you could see that, maybe you can see the, the hatch lines here are showing you uh, portions where BLM is in fact controlling those subsurface mineral rights. So returning to the title of our talk, um, the first divergence um, that we might uh, raise in our observations uh, engaged in this work is that the complexity of landowners and landholders actually are really confounding in all of this, that estate ownership diverges both horizontally and vertically. But let's telescope out a little bit further and to place this all in a bit of a larger context, um, what cultural heritage is at risk and why, again, from an archaeological perspective. So the Bureau of Land Management um, has a multi-use mission. Uh, the Farmington Field Office of the BLM, which is part of that map I just showed a moment ago, manages roughly 4.2 million acres. In February of 2014, the Farmington Field Office embarked on creating the Farmington Mancos Gallup Resource Management Plan Amendment and Environmental Impact Statement. And the scoping and preparation of a resource management plan um, and the EIS was initiated in February of 2014 and has gone over two scoping periods, which has involved lots and lots of meetings, both public um, and chapter houses and on. Um, and they've also publicly solicited input um, so anyone could uh, provide input on this process. So the goals of the RMP, I'm going to kind of try to go quickly here. Um, they're trying to revisit um, uh, their, their man, uh, management plan to reassess, uh, to update management of BLM administered lands and mineral estate in the Farmington Field Office. That's what the FFO there is. And that the decision area is in fact quite complicated as that map uh, tried to show um, it's encompassing both, uh, uh, Teresa Pasquale mentioned earlier, much of this land over 90% is already leased. Um, and so it's also pointing out here in this lower section, which comes from one of their other pu more recent publications um, on their newsletters as they send out on these updates, um, that they're encompassing this reasonable foreseeable development area, which is taking in other, other lands as well. Uh, as recommendations to those land managers about how they also might proceed. So then they published their scoping report. This came out May of last year. And this, I won't go into detail, but this is kind of gathering both, they've organized it in their two volume report so far, um, thematically categories that they've heard in terms of feedback for the planning issues, as well as additional issues that they heard from people about. Um, and you can just kind of skim the list here, cultural resources, noise, climate change, public health and safety, uh, environmental justice, socioeconomics, uh, and so on. So this is their kind of bulleted list that's at the front of the report, and there's much greater detail uh, embedded in volume one of that report. December 2017, um, the Trump administration publishes a national security document, strategy document, with an emphasis on domestic energy security. And we, in fact, heard about this initiative when we met with BLM officials on, on two different occasions. 
Um, and I'll draw your attention, this is pillar number two um, of that national security document, the first that was released by the Trump administration. And the bottom one here is in bold here for um, uh, highlighting, embrace energy dominance. So amongst the uh, priority actions listed associated with that pillar, um, as you can see here, involved reducing barriers, and I've underlined, while limiting regulatory burdens that encumber energy production and constrain economic growth. So in uh, January of 2018, the next month, uh, the BLM uh, publishes a draft um, version of their alternatives based on the feedback that they received, that summary I showed you just a moment ago. Um, and this is ornate, and this comes to us thanks to Archaeology Southwest. Um, there's a longer form version in the second newsletter that was released by the BLM Farmington Field Office talking about this process. But basically, the, the short course here, um, so BLM and BIA are involved in this process together at this point. Um, and so they have alternatives A through D, um, and they each have different sets of values that they're emphasizing. And there's two versions, the BLM version and the BIA version. And the, the final one here, the one at the very bottom, is the one that in, involves um, kind of unbridled energy development. So these are the uh, eight alternatives that the BLM is currently considering. This is the, um, a, a summary rubric, and the, like I said, the longer form is available in the newsletter that came out in, uh, I think, March maybe. So then uh, January 18, obviously it came out in January, uh, in January of 2018, the BLM also then, um, writ large, not the Farmington Field Office, issued an instruction memorandum, and this is the online version. You can go and visit it. You can't read it here. Maybe if I do my Zoom here, um, which points out um, in the instruction uh, memorandum that they're doing away with master leasing plans, which is one of the instruments that land managers had at their disposal to set longer term uh, plans uh, about how to, to manage lands um, as well as other previously passed 2010 leasing procedures. So then those are done away with um, in, er, in instruction uh, in uh, January of 2018. And shortly thereafter, oh, I should say, the memo states to simplify and streamline the leasing process to alleviate unnecessary impediments and burdens uh, and to expedite the offering of lands for lease and to ensure that oil and gas leases move forward quarterly. Um, next, we come to the sale of leases. So some of you might have followed this in the news. So pursuant of that memorandum, uh, some Chaco leases go forward, um, even though that RMP amendment process has not yet been completed. Um, the sale was set for the 8th of this month, um, and it was to include 25 parcels, including 4,434 acres within New Mexico's Rio, Arriba, Sandoval, and San Juan counties. In March 1st, um, uh, U.S. Secretary of the Interior, Ryan Zinke, deferred the Chaco lease sale, and I should emphasize here um, that he didn't cancel them. He deferred them, and here's a quote that uh, was covered in many national outlets as well um, in uh, the Albuquerque Journal. There's a quote, maybe you can read it here, uh, from Zinke. He says, we're going to defer those leases until we can do some cultural consultation. So that's where we are as far as Ruth and I understand it. Um, and to be clear, these leases, like I said, have been deferred. They have not been canceled. So now we come to divergence number two in our estimation um, that the BLM Farmington Field Office amendment process has now been upended um, by a shift in federal policy. So in the brief time remaining, maybe five minutes. Uh, I'm just going to quickly summarize some of the work that we've been involved in that connects in with the timeline that I just uh, reviewed there. Um, and this is work that uh, both Ruth Van Dyke and I have been involved in for the last three years or so and, and how our work has intersected with some of these events. Um, both independently and cooperatively, my co-author, uh, Dr. Van Dyke, and I have been involved in a range of research and preservation efforts focused on what we refer, and, and a number of others at this point are referring to as the greater Chacoan landscape. Uh, Dr. Van Dyke's work in the Four Corners region has long focused on issues of landscape, architecture, power, memory and phenomenology, and visual representation, uh, specifically focused on the Chacoan landscape. And my work has largely focused on monumental and vernacular houses within the central precinct of Chaco Canyon and has expanded outward, um, first through my involvement helping with the Chaco Research Archive and more recently through collaborations uh, with various academic, federal, tribal, and nonprofit entities who are concerned about the impacts to the greater Chaco landscape. So what does that term 
mean? Um, the term implies that there is, in fact, an itemized, complete, documented, and agreed upon set of features and sites that we all might point to as the definitive Chacoan landscape, a cultural landscape created and experienced by Native people living in the San Juan Basin during the 9th through 13th centuries and who shared particular cultural symbols and lifeways. And while we could spend some time uh, that we don't have uh, describing what characteristics, again, that archaeologists use to define that landscape, uh, the fact is that we're still learning to recognize and understand that landscape and are learning from our, our Native colleagues that we've been engaged with in this process in that regard. Um, in the course of our work, we've encountered a range of challenges both for defining and consequently for protecting uh, Chacoan archaeology beyond the boundaries of the park. In an August 2014 meeting, uh, the National Park Service provided some funding to convene a working group of individuals and institutions interested in the greater Chacoan landscape. And the working group was attended by representatives from various tribal and federal agencies, for-profit cultural resource management firms, nonprofit advocacy organizations, and as well as academic institutions. And the goal of that meeting in 2014 was to share information on current research efforts, build additional partnerships among researchers, help establish criteria for defining the Chacoan landscape, and create a prioritized list for how to proceed, um, both to document and protect those sites within the San Juan Basin. During those discussions, the divergent dimensions of landscape uh, management came to the fore, as you might imagine. For instance, it became clear that federal agencies like the Bureau of Land Management wanted and needed a clearer definition of the greater Chacoan landscape, and more specifically, they needed a definition that could be operationalized and, well, managed um, so that they could fulfill their multi-use mission. In other words, we couldn't just draw a massive circle on the map um, and, and say, you know, leave it all alone. Um, such an approach would be unrealistic. It also wouldn't acknowledge the reality of how much has already been leased, um, and, and it would not allow them to balance their various needs, um, including those of the oil and gas industry. And to be clear, the BLM makes land management decisions um, to protect cultural resources in accordance with all federal requirements, but to many of us in the room, the approach was way too atomistic, and we've heard a bit about this um, already today. And, and did not recognize all of the tangible and intangible dimensions of this landscape, nor did it take into account how many sites and archaeological features were still undocumented um, or had been only partially recorded, and we heard about that with regard to Bears Ears as well. Um, so now we get to divergences three and four. Um, and the BLM viewed the greater Chaco landscape in these discussions as sufficiently documented, um, and therefore they had a GIS of these sites, it's documented and therefore could be managed with existing procedures. Other cultural resource specialists, including research archaeologists such as ourselves, saw the errors in the data that they were using, uh, inaccurate site locations, for instance, and understood that the documentation of the greater Chacoan landscape as incomplete and emergent. Um, so these are some of the things we've been up to, um, and I'll just kind of quickly blaze through this. Um, so one of the things we tried to do to help the BLM was to take all these divergent sets of geospatial information about Chaco and Great House communities, not everything, but just the Great House communities, and reconcile them and give them better information because what they were getting out from the state cultural resource inventory system was inaccurate and outdated. Um, we published a white paper and shared that back with the BLM, again, from an archaeological perspective. Um, we held a capstone seminar just this past summer, um, and that's uh, the group that you're seeing here. Um, this was a scholarly conference of leading uh, researchers in, uh, to explore the anthropology, archaeology, heritage, and living use of Chacoan landscapes, and it's ultimately leading to a scholarly book and some open access web materials that are in fact in uh, native languages for uh, those communities. The online materials include video segments involving members of Pueblo and Navajo descendant communities talking about the importance of protecting the greater Chacoan landscape from their perspective. Um, and the LIDAR demonstration project I won't mention. Um, we also just kind of as a one-off, we had the fortunate opportunity, this came about through help from the Park Service, um, to do a, a NASA collaboration. They have these NASA Develop grants, which happen I think three times a year, so we did a summer one where they were using uh, basically data the government has already acquired through satellites um, to try to, to use that information to um, assess risk to some of these sites and perhaps sites that hadn't been fully documented. Um, and in September, 
a group of us also then participated in a, I think the term is a, a telepressor, a telepress conference um, that was uh, put, uh, put together with um, the leading organization being Archaeology Southwest. And um, some of you might be familiar with the Solstice Project, but they were involved, Anna Sofer and her group, um, GB Cornucopia, who's been a longtime interpreter in, in, in Chaco Culture National Historical Park, um, myself, Ruth Van Dyke, and, and Paul Reed. Um, Okay, so our work is but a small part of a much larger set of advocacy efforts at various levels. Individuals, nonprofit organizations, state politicians, tribal governments are all involved. And for instance, in September of last year, the All Pueblo Council of Governors passed a resolution calling on the Department of the Interior to, quote, complete an ethnographic study of cultural landscapes within the greater Chacoan region, end quote, emphasizing that these places, quote, continue to be places of prayer, pilgrimage, and living connections to our ancestors. Uh, Archaeology Southwest, who I've mentioned once or twice, is a remarkable nonprofit organization that continues to be deeply involved in these issues from an archaeological preservation side, both in terms of the Bears Ears uh, and the Greater Chaco Landscape, and they've been coordinating partnerships with multiple organizations and are also currently helping to push for an ethnographic study that you heard called for him by Zinke himself. Um, under our current federal administration, there are many issues to fight for. Um, and so many core values that seem under threat. Um, and as Chaco scholars, Dr. Van Dyke and I have chosen to focus our energies on what we know best, um, fighting to raise public awareness and convince legislators to protect, not destroy, the fragile and important legacy of northern New Mexico's ancient indigenous inhabitants. And the fight is far from over. And, and so I'll just, um, in, there have been a number of organizations that are well worth um, your investment in terms of resources and time and advocacy. I will add to that growing list of, uh, of worthy organizations that have been mentioned, um, Archaeology Southwest, the San Juan Citizens Alliance, uh, and the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance. And I just the URL here for the San Juan Citizens Alliance, they have a project that they've put up called Faces of Chaco that you might be interested in checking out. Thank you very much for your attention. We're going to hear next from Robert Lucero, the executive director of the Ute Indian Tribe Political Action Committee. He's going to give a pre presentation called How the Ute Tribe Has Used Mass Organizing Tools to Protect Tribal Sovereignty. Following his presentation, we're also going to ask the um, speakers to come back up and we're going to have a brief discussion with the audience. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my, uh, we just celebrated a uh, birthday party for my son, my, my two-year-old. He just turned two, um, and he's very into choo-choos, and his favorite part of the choo-choo is the caboose. So I'm the caboose <laughs> for today's uh, proceedings, happily. I miss the caboose. Those of you old enough to remember cabooses. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, so my name is Robert Lucero. I am the, uh, the founder and uh, director of the Ute Indian Tribes Political Action Committee. Uh, <clears throat> I have a consulting group that uh, I call the American System Group. Uh, the American System is a tradition that uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, an alum from Columbia, was one of the founders of. The, the tradition, that's sort of a better tradition uh, in U.S. history. Um, when I met the Ute Indian Tribe in uh, the summer of 2016, I had just founded my own political action committee that I called the New Deal PAC. Uh, so I'm an advocate of the New Deal, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, exciting elements in there um, for my generation, the generation that comes after the boomers uh, and the younger generation that we see now in, in, in Parkland and, and so forth or with the Parkland um, demonstrations. Uh, so when I met the, the Ute Indian tribe, they uh, <clears throat> wanted to possibly help my political action committee um, in going after Rob Bishop in District 1 in Utah. Um, at my suggestion, I said, well, it might be better if we just started a pack with your name. That way you could fight back in your name. And it would be uh, a lot more attractive, I think, to outside supporters. Uh, they weren't so sure uh, at first. 
but with a little uh, uh, encouragement, they went ahead and invested in starting the Ute Indian, Ute Indian Tribe Political Action Committee. So I am honored to uh, uh, be the director, and um, I'm also honored, of course, to be here. Thanks. I forgot to thank you when I came up. Uh, thanks to the uh, Italian Academy and Columbia University for, for having me and, and for having this wonderful event. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, something new in Indian country. Um, we're very proud of this, uh, and I'll just tell you a little bit about it. I don't have a, uh, uh, as grandiose uh, pictures as some other folks have had and graphs and such, but I just want to give you a little introduction into what we've done and, and invite you to look further into what we're doing in the future. So as I, as I said, the origins of our political action committee were in, in 2016 to uh, attempt to influence the election. Um, if you don't know, Utah is a very um, red state, as we say now. There's four congressional districts, and they're pretty solidly Republican. The first district, uh, as Raleigh mentioned earlier, is the, the top half, or top, not half, the top uh, quarter of Utah and it does include the reservation, but I would say the majority of voters by probably 80% are white Mormons or, more, or, or white Utahns. <laughs> um, and so they, uh, the margins there when it comes to the elections are pretty much like that, 70, 30. Um, so we, de we decided, uh, the U uh, Tribe Business Committee and our PAC to make uh, uh, TV network um, ads, and I'll show you one uh, at the end here, um, and also some radio ads, but we had a lot of mass outreach. We had a petitioning campaign that was a letter to um, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, asking him uh, in his capacity as a speaker to stop the actions of Rob Bishop and Jason Chaffetz at the time, um, the two Utah congressmen who were pushing the public lands initiative that Raleigh spoke of earlier. Um, that was, of course, giving Paul Ryan the benefit of the doubt, <laughs> um, appealing to his position more than his personality. So, um, in well, to, to, so Rob Bishop was reelected in the 2016 election. Um, he defeated uh, Peter Clemens, and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that toward the end. But as part of our campaign in 2016, we collected over 70,000 signatures. Um, hard copy through organizing like you see here and um, online as well. This is a uh, more recent picture actually. Uh, so it's not this petition campaign, but it's a newer petitioning campaign that uh, tribal leaders are helping with. So these are actually, uh, there's about four or five tribal members in this picture. This is at the Sundance Film Festival in Park City this past January. Uh, I don't know how you can, if you can make out the signs, but they say protect Ute lands, respect sovereignty, and there's a wanted sign of uh, <laughs> Rob Bishop for trying to steal Indian lands. If you don't know Rob Bishop, this is a nice juicy quote from something he said in 2017 at a, oops, at a, at a whoops, at a, at a town meeting in Vernal, which is not far from the Ute tribe reservation. Uh, if anyone likes the Antiquities Act the way it was written, die, I mean stupidity out of the gene pool. So this was actually on tape and it was used in a Salt Lake Tribune uh, editorial by the paper endorsing the, uh, the Peter Clemens campaign over Rob Bishop, um, a direct quote. I read this quote on a radio show and they said, wait, where did you get that from? <laughs> so they couldn't believe it themselves. In 2017, the Ute, Ute Pack was more active on the Bears Ears issue. Um, we're in this picture here, these signs that say respect and protect. Um, they say respect tribal sovereignty, protect Ute lands. So we've been participating in the rallies that are, that are being held at the state capitol or have been held. Uh, we've been doing grassroots fundraising uh, from a lot of individuals, uh, not just in Utah, but nationwide. There's been a lot of attention to uh, to Ute Pack and to what the Ute Tribe is trying to do on uh, protecting the sovereignty and on Bears Ears. Uh, and we've, of course, um, gotten more media attention for not just the Bears Ears issue, but the public lands initiative uh, issue that, that Raleigh mentioned earlier. For folks who might not have been here earlier, just to review um, briefly, the, the public lands initiative was really the major point for the Ute Indian Tribe in 2016. 
there was an attempt through Congress by Rob Bishop and Jason Chaffetz to take uh, 100,000 acres away from the Ute tribe outright and almost uh, half a million acres um, in, in so-called special management uh, clauses in the legislation. So, you know, you ask yourself, why would he, why would he do something like this? Um, you know, and there's a lot of sort of easy reasons you could throw at it, but one of the reasons in my view is uh, Bishop very stubbornly represents a culture in Utah that just does not respect tribal sovereignty. Uh, does not really respect the, the actual history of tribes in the, in the area, and um, he just really tries to trample on it. So part of the mission of Ute Pack is to just reaffirm, no, that sovereignty is, uh, is there, and the, the government-to-government -government relations that are supposed to happen between federal government and tribes needs to be uh, upheld. <clears throat> so Ute Pack in 2018 is... Uh, we're committed to a democratic majority in the House. Uh, we need to swing 24 seats to get that done. Uh, that would remove Bishop from his position as the chairman of the Natural Resources Committee. Uh, so uh, I know this is supposed to be not the most political, I don't know, this, I don't want to turn it into a uh, purely political event, but I have to say this, we are a PAC. <laughs> We also, um, we have a new sort of subgroup that's on the reservation itself, uh, because if you don't know, I'm not a Ute tribe member. Um, I uh, have a different personal history, but um, you know, my family's an old Southwest family. Um, we're kind of entertained by these uh, stories of, of Ute pioneers in the, in the 1840s. Um, my family, of course, like a lot of these other uh, uh, native folks, we were already there. My newest immigrants on my name side came, came to what's now the United States in 1590, my European side. So 30 years before Plymouth Rock and all that. So otherwise it's Mexican Indians and uh, you know Southwestern Indians. Um, so I'm not a member, but these are two, two ladies who are, uh, Jay Santa and, um, uh, sh wow, I'm forgetting her name right now. Sherry, I think. Um, Pardon me. Um, uh, Chapoose is her last name, and I'm, I'm Shelley. Excuse me. Um, the uh, so we have the committee on the reservation, and these are two of the officers of a group called the Ute Land Protectors. So their role is uh, to get more Ute tribe members um, educated on voting voting rights and uh, getting registered to vote. And um, we're also going to be looking for more help from uh, local elected officials to help our. Uh, tribal members uh, be, you know, more active in, in politics. But I, I can tell you that I, I was just at the uh, tribal meeting, a quarterly meeting as they call it, uh, meeting with a lot of the membership, and there was just a lot of excitement about, and a lot of pride in, in having a political action committee uh, for the tribe. The, the, the purpose, um, th this whole idea here of the uniqueness of the Ute Pack. So, PACs have a bad name, you know, and I, I forgot to mention that in the beginning, that, uh, you know, PACs are viewed as, you know, the Ford Company PAC, the Exxon Oil PAC, these kinds of things. So we're taking a move to uh, take that back, take the better side of what Citizens United actually can do for, for people in the U.S., which is um, allow us to have a, a mass-based mass support political action committee in this case, we have funding that does come from the, the Ute tribe itself, but we're also raising funds and support from outside of the tribe, from around the country, uh, and then raising support in, um, as you say, on, on the streets, where we're actually organizing to get out the word about what, uh, what is happening to the Ute tribe. So, um, as it says here, it's, it's a vehicle to build popular support for the issues that the Ute tribe is, uh, is fighting. So. That's, that's pretty much what I had. I, I wanted to just show on the, uh, up here, this, this is the article when the Ute Pack was established. It says that the Ute tribe declares political war. Um, I would say it should have said the Ute Pack decides to fight back because it wasn't like the tribe or the Ute tribe. The Ute tribe didn't just come out of nowhere and establish this pack. It was an attempt to fight back against Bishop and it actually, it actually has worked. His contributions from Indian tribes have uh, collapsed since 2016. He used to get some, some funding because he's the chair of the resource committee and the subcommittee on Indian affairs. 
So um, tribes wanted to essentially uh, keep him somewhat happy. But after we founded this PAC, we, we, we actually sent out a letter saying, uh, if you're going to contribute to him, you should match that to Ute PAC. They didn't do that, but they stopped contributing to him in 2016. So that was fun. Uh, this is this is our, our TV ad. Um, we spent more money on getting it on the air than we spent on producing it. So forgive me if it's a little, uh, uh, you know, not not the best quality, but it was one of our first runs. Can you play it? Not since the 1800s have the government tried a Native American land grab like the one buried in Bishop's Utah Public Lands Commission. Bishop doesn't want to include Utah's original residents, but you tried in the conversation. Bishop refused to partner with the tribe to draft a bill that could pass Congress because he wants control over their land. He even tried to pit the tribe against youth school children. That's just wrong. Youth students benefit the most by keeping tribal lands. Don't send Rob Bishop back to Washington. Elect Peter Clemens. Authorized and paid for by the youth pack. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, we ran a radio ad after that, so I'm going to play the next one. And he loves that suit, by the way. One of the tribal leaders told him he looked like Colonel Sanders to his face. Anyhow, that's a little sampling of our first salvos against him. Well, that's what I had. Thank you very much for, for having us. <laughs> Let's just keep playing that. That'll be great. <laughs> our website, okay? Thank you. That's a cry which needs to be made, which, me which needs to be heard, because we need our representatives, assigned or elected representatives, those who are supposed to be on all our sides. We need them to be present. We need everybody to listen to all the extraordinary nuances of the discussion we've had today. It's been approached from every possible angle, from water to textiles, from art to buildings, from music to people's rights, from nutrition to um, ancient climate. Um, these are all things that are represented by the kinds of discussions, by the kinds of discussions we've had today, and the kind of losses that we face in indigenous places, and uh, represented so well by Bears Ears and Chaco. There are many, many others, Grand Canyon, Escalante as well, of course. So I could not be more grateful to you, and I'm saying this now before we all leave, because I wonder perhaps the panel can come forward and just, we could perhaps, we'll have seven and a half minutes of discussion, because that's all that Elsa, our great Elsa and Ono have been great. I have to thank you for your excellent uh, moderation of today. That's all they've allowed us. But perhaps we can ask ourselves, what are the next steps? Let us not lose the chance which we've had this afternoon. And thank you all very much for being here. It's been very important that you've come today and sat through a long day of these rich discussions. So Elsa and Honor, why don't you take over from me? But thank you in the meantime.
Well, we have a wonderful uh, panel here. Um, I want to thank everyone for participating today and for those folks who are still with us right now. I think many of you. Um, it's been a long day. Um, but um, we're going to open up this uh, panel for questions. And hopefully we can have about five to 10 minutes, I think, for, for answers. All right. Go ahead. Uh, the idea is a question of accessibility for Bears Ears. Um, that's a good question because I think it really depends on um, what you're intending to do. A lot of people are, you know, hiking, camping, biking, uh, just doing like a lot of kind of outdoors related activity. More in the northern part, it's a lot of climbers, uh, especially um, towards Moab and Indian Creek area. So um, I guess it's really dependent on what you want to do. But we're trying to like advise people on like if you're going to do something that you approach with respect and that you have an idea of what it is that the indigenous community would like out of you as a visitor, you know, the expectations um, that people would have that they should be realistic and practical, but also that you have to be open and willing to like, you know, understand it and listen our perspective of how it is that you can improve your visitation to our place. Um, I always liken it to like being a guest in somebody's house. So you want to respect the house and re respect the, the host. So, um, oh yeah, there's a lot of roads, there's a lot of trails, uh, there's a lot of different um, uh, camping areas. But again, that's part of the respecting those places is try to stay off of like the really delicate, ecologically, you know, sensitive areas, especially the sacred sites. Like, you know, don't touch them, don't disturb them, don't camp in them, don't, you know, <laughs> take them home. Like all these like basic <laughs> things you would think that people would know about don't and they don't ask. You can't really think of it as like a uh, like a sort of um, streamlined, organized, legitimized space because um, you know a lot of people do think that because of a park thing. But we're not trying to be that. We're trying to actually encourage human interaction with the environment in a respectful way, which Native peoples have always done. But um, we're trying to dispel that whole kind of idea about. This is a park that you come and visit at a gate that charges you all these things. And, you know, it's just, it's not the same ideal. Um, this is, is a, an indigenous approach to the land as opposed to like a, a Western linear methodical approach. Yeah, it's a long answer. <laughs> Anyone else like to answer that? Oh. and technical difficulties here. <laughs> I'd like to uh, also uh, uh, kind of add to the, to the wonderful answer Angelo did. Uh, uh, the, there, there's another a nonprofit group, uh, the Friends of Cedar Mesa, uh, that have uh, volunteered and put placards up uh, uh, that um, you know educates uh, what the natural plants are, like yucca and and uh, you know like a, a Spanish broom or and other. Uh, uh, you know, plant, plant, traditional plant biotas. And with the BLM and the, the field offices in Monticello and Moab, uh, they have well-established trailheads uh, to in, encourage uh, uh, a visitation of these ruins. Uh, the, 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 there was a reason why uh, on, the, on, the, on the PowerPoint uh, I showed those uh, pueblos, uh, those are the ones that are open to the public. Uh, what, uh, what was encouraged to uh, allow to have visitors to educate themselves. Uh, but the, as Angelo had pointed out, and actually, all, uh, everyone as speakers have pointed out that people live in them and people are still buried in many of them. Uh, they're, they're, that's where they're, they're intentionally uh, uh, closed off. But I encourage you to visit, uh, uh, all of you to visit uh, uh, Utah or New Mexico or Arizona uh, and, er and Colorado to, to visit the, the, uh, all the ancestral sites. Thank you, next question, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, 
is a, a really weird question, perhaps, but as I've been listening all day, and thank you very much, it's been very educational. I've been impressed at how many nations you have that find uh, Bears Ears to be spiritual to them, that it's shared among so many nations, um, you know, native nations. And I just kept thinking to Jerusalem and how that's also a shared sacred or holy site, and obviously with the UN and cross national and cultural. Um, connections. I just wonder if anybody has made any kind of connection or established any relationships in terms of another sacred site in, in the world. Um, can I say something about that? Um, I had a um, Ute tribe member who's an educator in uh, Salt Lake uh, make an interesting point to me about the importance of an aspect of what you're alluding to, which is. Um, she said, you know, if you think of the Ute storytelling, um, it, the creation story um, includes a story that the Ute tribe came from what's now California into the mountains in Salt Lake, or in, 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 what's in Utah. Um, <clears throat> and then in that story, God's telling them to go into that, that area, the creator is telling them. Uh, of course, there were other people who were told by God to go west <laughs> in the 1840s. So Utah um, has become uh, sort of like an American Israel in the sense that you have, you know, our own Palestinians and Israelis there. So this is, again, this is my language now. This is something that I thought about some months ago, too, that um, th th there is a parallel. And, and you find it when you're in the trenches in Utah. So for me, I've done political work in California. I've done political work in New York, um, Michigan, other places. Nothing is like Utah, you know. It's a special place, right? Um, and <clears throat> um, it has had some better moments in its history, as far as actual uh, openness. And there's been some Democratic governors and Democratic congressmen. Um, but right now, it's a very one-sided system that tries to do a lot of different things to exclude these voices that you're hearing today. So um, that's what I would say as far as part of the answer to your question. Uh, somebody else might have something else. <coughs> Anyone else have any other? Would they like to address it? No? Okay. Okay. Um, well, if I could, because I think Robert maybe was just trying to be a little bit too gentle on his reply. <laughs> <laughs> Please. The, the experience of the, the tribes and the Bears Ears region and, and then Utah, which Robert was kind of equating to Jerusalem, is not the experience of a shared um, spiritual place, which is what President Obama's proclamation sort of originally tried to create. Instead, what we experience on the ground and in this current administration is uh, what Robert said, which is more like the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the Pal Palestinian experience in Jerusalem which is uh, an experience of um, being walled off and right. um, oppressive and um, trying to push out. So right. just, uh, just kind of want to amplify and maybe sort of clarify what Robert said. Okay. All right, any other questions? Go ahead. For those of us that weren't here earlier in the day, and not a full summary, just, uh, <laughs> just an idea of what, what our move should be to help. <clears throat> There's a GoFundMe.com page for the Navajo Nation. Feel free to donate to that for our legal, <laughs> legal funds. Um, I think just being, you know, talking about the issue and being supportive, you know, one of the reasons that the Attorney General for the Nation felt like it was important to be part of this conversation is because um, it's not too often that representatives from the nation make it out here, and we hope that by doing so, you know, we'll, you guys will continue to talk about it. It's something that you will continue to, you know, discuss with others when you go home, and you know, really keeping it front and center. And so I think that that even just as basic as that is just saying, I, you know, I ha I went to this presentation. These discussions were had, and um, is helpful. I think that uh, there was a comment made earlier about how. You know, it's easy. Some people don't, and my own fam, some of my own family members included, like forget that Native Americans still exist. And so, you know, we're keeping that presence. And the more we're talked about it, the harder it is for people to not acknowledge the existence and that these struggles are continuing to happen today. I'm going to add one more point to that, if you don't mind, to 
just one more thing on your question, which is um, a simple one, which is listen to what the tribes are actually saying. So, for example, in Utah, you get people say, well, I thought the, there's tribe, the, I thought the Indians or the tribes were against the monument. So they read one headline or some packaged uh, statement from the state of Utah, the governor's office, or they see Rebecca Benali being promoted as the Indian voice in Utah. Um, well, take the next step for people in the audience and for telling your friends, look up what the tribes are saying themselves. Look at go. The U Tribe has a website that's the tribal website. We also have a U PAC that's a PAC website that has more information. But those are two places where you can see what the the U Tribe is saying itself, right? What are the what are the actual outlets that represent the tribes saying? So I think what we constantly have to tell people is listen to the tribes. Listen first, right? And if you think you're listening, make sure you're double checking and you're actually getting the voice of the tribes. Um, and also, that's great. That's a good point. Uh, I want to follow up with that too. Is um, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, excitement and energy about um, you know trying to make it a huge movement again, sort of in a Standing Rock way. But we encourage you know sort of against that because it's not yeah. the same situation. It's not Standing Rock in the way that you, it could endure an occupation. Um, it's a delicate environment. There's a lot of sacred sites. There's um, no water. <laughs> like it's a very, there's a different set of circumstances there. And it's good to ask that question, how to be uh, supportive in this effort. And a lot of that right now is in with the courts. So to, you know, kind of help supporting that legal fund, but also the listening to the tribes piece is super important. And if we do have planning and we do have expectations of visitors, one of those um, outlets is, you know, the intertribal gathering that we have in the summer, which is in July, and which I invited everybody here to come to. But I think that's really important in, in terms of we know that's a temporary thing. We know that that's something that we're sharing openly, and you have all of the tribes there, and we can all tell you face to face how important it is, and then you can participate in that. So it's not uh, it's not the same as having um, somebody else from a different source tell you what, what it's like and why bears ears is important. So I just wanted to follow that up in agreement with what they're saying. Okay. All right, um, go ahead. The, the doctrine of the trust doctrine that, that, uh, that certain special things such as navigable waters, such as oceanfront property, or whatever, national things which are held in trust by the government mm -hmm. cannot be frittered away by that government. It must be held in trust for the people that benefit from it. And it seems to me that groundwater or, or, or drinkable water in the Standing Rock situation uh, are things which are so valuable that perhaps uh, it, an argument can be made. It may not be a successful argument this year. In 10 years it might be a successful argument that these things should be held in trust, that the government is not allowed to give people permits to do things which would poison the water bottle, which would uh, uh, fill up plastic water bottles with the pool of water taken from on the I think that's a very interesting, it's an interesting take on it. The water, um, I'm not a water lawyer, so I can't, there's a lot of very nuances that we have our own in-house attorneys. All they do is the water law litigation. Um, but I think it's an interesting idea. I think it's the way that the water wa law structure is set up in the West, it's highly, highly regulated. I'm, is, you're nodding your head in awareness, so. But it's, I mean, it, it is an interesting idea. So I'll send you their email, and you can share that idea with them. <laughs> and we'll win our cases. Okay, I think this will probably be the last question. Go ahead. Um, all the information you shared was really fascinating. Thank you so much for coming. Um, uh, my question was, um, everything we discussed, um, the, the impact on uh, the Native peoples here in this uh, continental U.S., it, it, we, I understand that. Um, but I also like to understand what impacts we have 
do you anticipate these changes to various years and um, the hopes that the Trump administration might come up for um, these monuments? How would it affect the individual lives of um, indigenous native peoples, their families, communities? Do you anticipate this might uh, change the context of communities, maybe some indigenous native peoples might move to other communities? Is there a health threat? Um, <laughs> What type of complications, issues do you anticipate or do you fear? I'll, I'll take that question. Now, the you know the, the reason why uh, the, the the American public really doesn't know about the uh, the Southwest tribes, especially the Pueblos, uh, the spring equinox is upon us, and there are several. Uh, uh, holy societies from the 19 Pueblos, the non-secular leadership, are out there right now in the Bears Ears National Monument. Uh, these ruins have active altars. Uh, with permission, the uh, Hoven Weep uh, Pueblo uh, by the Colorado-Utah border, uh, the Pueblo of San Felipe and Jemez are over there right now fasting, uh, the groups. And the Grand Syracuse Escalante, Santa Ana Pueblo is out there right now as well. Uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, the holy societies are, are sequestered inside uh, some of the ruins. They're fasting. They won't eat until the, the equinox is upon us. So these are act, these, these are active um, uh, areas of prayer, and there are people still buried out there. So um, so it would it would be absolutely catastrophic uh, uh, to the New Mexico pueblos, uh, 19, all 19 of them, uh, because the it's a direct violation of the freedom of religion, uh, tribal sovereignty, and I'm trying to br uh, make the uh, comparison. It is it is tantamount. They would take a bulldozer out and, you know, take it over to the St. Charles Church over there, and to the uh, to the cathedral uh, to the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City, and we mow it down, and put a whoopee cushion uh, uh, factory on top of it or something, you know. So the, uh, that's you know that's the comparison I have. Uh, so the the pre the present impact is is a uh, the, the the cultural and the ancestral lands they overlap these imaginary uh, boundaries uh, drawn by. Um, you know uh, uh, the, the the forefathers of this country. You know uh, it uh, it doesn't follow you know state lines or county lines. Uh, but uh, the the migration routes that I shared earlier, uh, uh, you know, the, the, those are the transition ruins of which uh, the, the Pueblos have from uh, Salt Lake City all the, all the way down to Holbrook, Arizona, at the Petrified National Forest. There's over 2,000 kivas or areas of worship, and uh, the they're they're still very active right now. So the, the, those would be the modern impact. Yeah. Uh, I think also one of the big paradigm shifts we're seeing is that there's kind of a movement towards state-centered uh, management of these types of places, right? And so instead of the geography being based on indigenous ways of, of viewing the landscape and understanding it, we're seeing it being divvied up by states. So for example, in, in the House Bill 4532, you have only the tribes from Utah that have a voice in how that particular area is managed. And kind of this segmenting based on a settler geography, I think is incredibly damaging. It could impact many, many other tribes um, throughout the country. You know, I'll, if all of a sudden individual states have the say in how these things are managed, you know, what's the next step? Um, and how will we be cut off from one another? Um, it, could a Bears Ears coalition exist in the future, or would we have to go through other channels to be able to interact? It, anyway, it, it seems very disruptive, and so that's, I think, um, one of the biggest interventions we need to make is that, no, you know, if, if it's gonna be federal, okay, it's federal, but it really needs to be centered on tribes and their attachments to the lands. But also, um, just to put it out there, because it hasn't been said, but it's been indicated by the government, right? Like, if one monument is on the table, then all the monuments are on the table, really. Yeah. Like, if you can undo this one, you pull the thread, and it undoes all the other ones, right? So, just like in the tradition of, you know, uh, Tanya Frischner from the UN, she always used to say that, right? It's like, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Yeah. Yeah. She always used to say that. Special Rapporteur, Indigenous Peoples, um, great mentor, great teacher. And think about it, what is the end game for this? What is the, what is the goal, right? And really, if you're undoing these federal land protections, these monuments, uh, these parks, then they're looking at 
the the basic kind of uh, extraction, exploitation, the use of these beautiful places uh, for something other than their protection. And where are some of those spaces? They're indigenous places. They're indigenous reservations. They're sacred lands. They're places we already live in. But there's also federal. So really, in a whole continuum, if you look at this, it's pointing towards that, the eventual termination of tribes and their lands. And that's what we're looking at, you know? I mean, it's great everybody's talking about public lands and they're talking about like monuments and all this stuff, but look at the big picture. Look at the overall trajectory of the direction that we're heading in. And that's what it points towards for me. So these are important conversations to have because this is just the beginning. Um, we're far from over having these discussions. Thank you, Angelo. I'd like to um, thank our panelists here for um, answering the questions of the audience. And I think that our Columbia hosts are going to close out the day. Um, as usual, um, Angelo put it on the line, um, you know, and the last question put it on the line. Um, if one monument is at stake, all the others are at stake. So this is why we are putting our foot down right now. I can't thank all of you. First of all, our speakers, our moderators, but those of you who have stayed here all day long to help us do our best to put our foot down, say these kinds of actions must stop. We should move forward together. We should respect the tribal rights. We should do, those of us who come from the outside, we should continue that respect, but we must stand together in, as I say, putting our foot down and um, doing what we can. You have done an amazing job, both our speakers who have been quite wonderful, fascinating, absorbing, composed, full of eloquence. I can't thank you enough, but I'm also grateful that you have stayed here this afternoon. And so, let's go and have a drink, let's go and have a little bit to eat, let's refresh ourselves, and I look forward to seeing you next year. We're going to do this again, and we're going to make it bigger, better, and more cutting and salient than ever. Thank you so much, all. Come back again. Thank you so much for being here.